T minus 10, 9, 8, The clock is seven. operating. We're underway. Tag quality base here. Endeavor, go and run left. Human drama unfolding in Haiti as survivors of massive flooding seek badly needed aid. And they're at it again. Florida residents prepare for yet another massive hurricane. Stay with us for that. Welcome back. An overwhelmingly tragic situation turns dangerously desperate for victims of a natural and man-made disaster in Haiti. Officials say massive flooding fueled by deforestation has left at least 1,160 people dead, another 1,250 missing and some 300,000 homeless. But the slow pace of relief is sowing panic in some areas. Carl Penhall has more. They've survived the storm. They've lost loved ones and their homes have been destroyed. Now they're hungry and thirsty. Hours of waiting under a blazing sun, scuffles to get a place in line. No guarantee of filling their bellies tonight. The water took all our stuff. We can't stand it anymore, she says. Hunger, frustration, desperation. An explosion waiting to happen. Soldiers from the United Nations force originally brought in to restore political stability fire into the air and lob tear gas canisters. They fear a riot is about to erupt and people are getting crushed. The crowds have pulled back for now, but the Argentinian troops here know it's going to be a battle to maintain law and order. They also think somebody in the crowd may have a gun. Troops on the ground call urgently to comrades on rooftops to try and identify armed gang members among the hungry. I think gangs want to take advantage and loot the food and provoke riots to discredit the aid effort, he says. Tempers fray even among the lucky ones who managed to receive their food rations. These women almost came to blows as they tried to share out peas in a small bucket. At the moment it's really very difficult to assess exactly what the impact has been, how profound it's been. I mean, most of these families down here have very little anyway, and so this is kind of pushing them right over the edge with having something like this happen to them again. A short drive away from the chaos of the food handout, parts of Gonaive are still underwater. Residents try to push mud out of the church that's now their shelter. Like thousands of others, Timan Dolcius's home was destroyed. Some of her neighbors were among the more than 1,200 who died. She escaped with her two children. We haven't eaten, she says. She's one of 700 people crammed in the church. She says she's received no food aid and is surviving on scraps. Back at the food distribution center, aid workers say Haitian authorities have done nothing to help the needy. Shortages of drinking water are fueling fears of the outbreak of disease. As if the survivors of Tropical Storm Jean don't have enough misery to contend with. Carl Penhall, CNN, Gonaive, Haiti. Well, the storm that uh, pounded Haiti is now a hurricane and taking aim at the U.S. state of Florida, which is still recovering from three other massive hurricanes that battered the state in recent weeks. Last reported, Hurricane Jean was uh, centered about 90 kilometers east of Great Abaco Island in the northwestern Bahamas. 385 kilometers east of Florida's Atlantic coast. Now, the storm's eye is expected to pass near or over the Abaca Islands later Sunday and uh, close in on Florida by early Sunday. Storm-weary residents of the Sunshine State may soon want to change that Florida nickname. Jean is expected to hit some of the uh, same debris-ridden areas hard hit by hurricanes Charlie and Francis and uh, residents of the Florida Panhandle ravaged by Hurricane Ivan just a little over a week ago are also casting a wary eye toward Jean. No U.S. state has been struck by four hurricanes in one season since Texas in 1886. Combined, the three storms that have already struck Florida are blamed for at least 70 deaths and billions of dollars in damage. Well, for more on Hurricane Jean and the rest of the international weather forecast, Kevin Corvo joins us now from the Weather Center. Kevin, busy day for you. Busy day, and it's going to be a busy weekend. First, we had Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and now Jean. And here's the most current satellite we have. You can see that it's moving into the uh, eastern part of the Bahamas really soon. And we are going to see that Freeport should see the eye of the hurricane go over them within the next, uh, I would say, the next six to nine hours or so. 
The system, we just got the newest update. The system is continuing to make a nice westward progression at about 22 kilometers per hour. That's going to keep it right on track for making landfall into the uh, east coast of Florida here. We are going to see that increase right now. Uh, the winds are 168 kilometers per hour. That is 10 kilometers per hour from being a Category 3. And we do expect that to be a Category 3 by the time it makes uh, landfall in Freeport and also as it makes its way into parts of uh, Florida and that's going to be approximately uh, early Sunday morning. Now we just had some phone calls asking what's going to happen as the system moves into central Florida. We do think it's going to stay category two, quickly diminish to a category three as it moves uh, category one as it moves into Orlando area. Airports should be closed in that area as well as all the theme parks will probably be closed as well. As we take a look at what's going to happen for the rest of the time frame, by 48 hours we are going to see Monday morning that system in northern Florida then continuing to push up to the northeast into the Carolinas by 72 hours. But we do expect that, that system continues to make its way up to the northeast, possibly even affecting parts of New England by the middle of the week with a lot of heavy rain there. Let's take a look at what's happening on the radar. We are going to see these feeder bands start to move in. These are the last 12 hours. Really, a lot of precipitation is now happening over the Bahamas here. We haven't yet seen the precipitation affecting parts of Florida. This is one of our most current um, next rads I want to show you, getting a little bit closer to the situation as my machine will, there we go, start to move into the Miami radar. We are seeing the, uh, the showers are starting to come into the picture here getting very close to parts of Fort Lauderdale as well as uh, uh, Vero Beach up here to the north. So we're going to start to watch this even more closely over the next couple hours. Let's take a look at what's going to happen rain-wise over the next 24 hours. A lot of rain is going to fall for parts of Florida. Heavy flooding. Remember, though, flooding, winds, and tornadoes are going to be a very significant factor for this particular area. As we take a look at what's going to happen for Saturday, we are going to see, though, for the rest of the country, not too bad. Enjoy your weekend on the East Coast because things are going to start to change as we look into Monday, Tuesday, and even Wednesday here. The rest of the country, not looking too bad. Temperature-wise, we are going to see those temperatures fairly warm for the southeast. Atlanta, you're looking at 27, Miami at 30. Now, last reported, Hurricane Jean was centered just over Marsh Harbor on Abaco Island in the northwestern Bahamas. It's about 310 kilometers east of Florida's Atlantic coast. The storm is expected to close in on Florida later Saturday. With more on Jean, Kevin Corva joins us now from the World Weather Center. And Kevin, before we get to Jean, let's talk about what's happening in other parts of the world right now. Absolutely. I want to show you first what's happening in Africa because that's where all these tropical waves begin. We've had 13 tropical waves that have turned into either depressions, uh, tropical storms or hurricanes and this is basically where they start out. As the air heats up over here in what we call the intertropical convergence zone, it then starts to move over into the Atlantic Ocean where it starts to get the moisture. And we are going to see a couple more, uh, probably for the next month and a half, a couple more waves start to push out there. So we're still not out of the woods. We still have tropical storm season for the Atlantic all the way for this month and also into next month. Well, that same storm that drenched Haiti is a tropical storm, now a Category 3 hurricane in the Atlantic. And at this hour, Hurricane Jean is battering the northwestern Bahamas, including the Abacos, Bimini, Eleuthera, Grand Bahama Island, and New Providence. Later Saturday, the storm is expected to zero in once again on the U.S. state of Florida, making it the fourth major hurricane to hit the still debris-ridden state in recent weeks. Our Susan Candiotti standing by live in West Palm Beach with the latest. Susan, been there, done that, and you're doing it again. We are, Jonathan. Uh, a place of learning has now turned into a place of refuge for many Palm Beach County, Florida residents. This is one of the possible target areas for Hurricane Jean, one of about 15 shelters that is open uh, in this area. Last time when Hurricane Francis hit, 19,000 people took advantage of them. The day is young. Only 6,000 people have showed up so far. About as human nature goes, sometimes people do wait until the last minute before they attempt to show up at area shelters here. Here in Palm Beach County, people are responding to a mandatory evacuation for anyone who lives in a low-lying, flood-prone area or who live in mobile homes that are susceptible to possible tornadoes that are spawned from hurricanes. The big question now is how many people will be showing up at these evacuation shelters. So many of them are shell-shocked and hurricane-weary and want to stay in their homes instead of getting out as the Florida governor has asked them to. We have also seen at, for example, home improvement stores this day, people buying plywood, 
to board up their homes doing some last minute preparations. In one case, no one had any power generators left. We also are seeing long lines of people outside gasoline stations. If you can find one open, to top off your cars or other vehicles with gasoline. Uh, joining us now, a couple of people who took refuge in this very same shelter for Hurricane Francis. When you heard Jean was coming your way, you must have thought, what? I thought, oh no, not again. I, I was just so surprised that I was sure it wasn't going to come, and then it came, and we were going to stay at home, but then when we heard this morning that the storm had taken a you know turn for the worse i said oh no i'm going you better get out just to be safe oh, yes and they were really wonderful to all the people here last time what kinds of things did you bring with you to try to get comfortable of course uh, it's not the best place to be if you're seeking comfort uh, pillows a uh, mat to, to lay on a cover so forth and the most important thing is we brought chairs to sit on I found out that's important to have a chair. How did you prepare your home before you came here? Storm shutters. I have storm shutters that you just pull down like this here. Great. So I put them up in about 20 minutes. So despite the fact that your house is boarded up, you still came here. Oh, yeah. I feel safe here. And, my, and I want to say one thing. My hat is off to the Red Cross here. They've done a wonderful job. We appreciate it. They do around the world. You're right about that. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, earlier this day, Florida's Governor Jeb Bush held a news conference and, and issued uh, uh, the expectation and his hope that people will pay attention to the evacuation orders and really be ready for this storm. This morning's storm update reminds us once again that every storm is different. And I sincerely hope that Floridians on our East Coast will take this to heart. Uh, where Francis was a slow storm, Jean um, has sped up and is moving quickly to our coast, and it is getting bigger and stronger. This area is already starting to experience the very outer bands, tropical storm force winds just beginning this afternoon here, with the eye wall possibly hitting very late tonight. Jonathan, back to you. Thanks very much. Susan Candiotti from West Palm Beach, Florida. People living in the Cayman Islands are just now beginning to recover from Hurricane Ivan, which blew through about 10 days ago. Tanya Streeter, the world record holder as it happens in free diving, joins us now on the line from Grand Cayman Island. Uh, she is there. What is the view of recovery as you see it? How are things looking a few days on? Um, hi, Jonathan. Well, we're 11 or 12 days out after the storm now, so remarkably, actually, there is an enormous amount of, of the island that has been cleaned up, but there's still a vast proportion of it that is without power, without water, and, and it's still a lot of people that are suffering, a lot of people homeless still. Have there been difficulties in getting material in, getting um, proper food and other supplies into people there? There certainly were those types of difficulties in the beginning. There was a lot of frustration by the local people on island and also people um, concerned about their relatives who were, um, you know, people overseas concerned about their relatives here just because there was certainly the feeling that aid that was necessary was um, not accepted or certainly that media were turned away from the island in the initial aftermath. Um, kind of at the expense, obviously, of the people that were suffering with the idea to to maintain Cayman's um, kind of uh, reputation as being somewhere that is stable um, as a financial community. But unfortunately, a lot of people are still suffering at that time. So you're thinking maybe officials on the island tried to locate this, maybe? Oh, uh, there's certainly a very strong belief, which I believe in too, that this was certainly something that was low-keyed um, with, as I said before, the idea of protecting our, our reputation, and not just as a tourism destination, but also as a financial destination. I don't say this to be flippant, Tanya. You spend a lot of time in the water. Have you, chance to, have you had a chance to get out in the water and see if any of the reefs have been damaged or anything like that? No, I haven't had a chance. It's not unfortunately been my priority to get out and go uh, go free diving. I've really been trying to help families and friends um, clean up their places. But, you know, nature is incredible. Nature is already coming back on the island, and I, I don't think that underwater will be any different. And I think that Cayman will always still be a beautiful place to visit and to dive in. At this point in time, the people are still suffering tremendously. I've just driven around the island today, and I've seen houses that are four foot full of sand and people that are displaced and homeless and we do still need help here we still need aid and i believe that we need manpower um to help them come that to help those people who can't clean up for themselves it's just overwhelming all right tanya streeter uh, a witness to what's happening in terms of the rebuilding of grand cayman thanks so much tanya am nachmittag hatte john bereits die bahamas erreicht auf haiti sind die folgen des sturms verheerend andrea ohms berichtet am nachmittag ist er da 
Hurricane Jeanne fegt über das sonst so sonnenverwöhnte Inselparadies der Bahamas mit 160 Stundenkilometern, der Himmel dunkel, die Palmen am Strand überflutet. Die Einwohner haben zum großen Teil in Notunterkünften Schutz gesucht. Auch in den USA werden Lebensmittel und Wasservorräte angelegt, der Tank aufgefüllt. In Florida soll der Sturm morgen zuschlagen. Gouverneur Bush warnt, jetzt ist der Zeitpunkt, die Häuser zu verlassen und sich in Sicherheit zu bringen. 800.000 Menschen auf der Flucht vor dem Hurricane, zum vierten Mal in wenigen Wochen. Wir haben es so satt. Ich finde, wir haben genug davon gehabt hier in Florida. Vier Hurricanes in sechs Wochen ist wirklich ein bisschen viel. Mehr als 1000 Menschen sind durch Jeanne auf Haiti gestorben. Dort brechen die ersten Unruhen aus. Die Hilfe kommt zu langsam und reichen tut sie bei weitem nicht. Verzweifelte Haitianer versuchen, einen Lastwagen mit Lebensmitteln zu stürmen. Nur mit Tränengas und Schüssen in die Luft können Soldaten der UN-Hilfstruppen die Menschen abwehren. Eine Woche nach dem Sturm kommt immer noch kaum Hilfe über die zerstörten Straßen durch. Immer noch werden mehr als 1000 Menschen vermisst und Hunderttausende haben alles verloren. Wieder packen Sie die Koffer, wieder vernageln Sie Ihre Fenster. Zum vierten Mal in zwei Monaten rüsten sich die Bewohner von Florida für einen Hurricane. Dieses Mal ist es der Tropensturm Jeanne oder Jean, wie die Amerikaner sagen, vor dem sich hunderttausende Menschen in Sicherheit bringen. Seine tödliche Kraft hat er bereits gezeigt. In Haiti starben durch Jean wahrscheinlich mehr als 2000 Menschen. Aus den USA, Ulrich Oppold. Die internationale Hilfe ist angelaufen, trotzdem haben viele Menschen auf Haiti seit einer Woche kaum noch etwas zu essen. Soldaten der UN-Friedenstruppen müssen Lebensmittellager mit Gewalt verteidigen, gegen die Hungernden und Verzweifelten. Der Tropensturm Jean hat auf Haiti Leid und Zerstörung hinterlassen. Jetzt nimmt er Kurs auf die Bahamas. Erste Ausläufer sind dort in der Nacht angekommen. Viele Menschen wurden in Sicherheit gebracht. Über dem warmen Atlantik tankt er noch einmal Kraft auf. Als Hurricane der Kategorie 3 wird er morgen früh Ortszeit die Küste Floridas erreichen. Ich weiß, die Menschen sind frustriert und haben das alles satt. Glauben Sie mir, Ihr Gouverneur auch. Charlie, Francis, Ivan und jetzt Jean. Vier Wirbelstürme in nur fünf Wochen. Die Menschen hier müssen wieder mit dem Schlimmsten rechnen. Sie sind gerade dabei, die Schäden des letzten Hurricanes aufzuräumen. Schon kommt der Nächste. Ich kann das einfach nicht glauben, nicht schon wieder. Und wieder werden Tankstellen belagert, 800.000 Menschen evakuiert. Ich brauche Sprit für meinen Generator. Doch viele weigern sich inzwischen schon wieder ihre Sachen zu packen, auch wenn die Behörden warnen, dass die herumfliegenden Trümmer lebensgefährlich werden können. Wir werden ihr die Stirn bieten und wir bleiben hier. Auch die NASA in Cape Canaveral hat die Schäden des letzten Wirbelsturms noch nicht behoben. Ähnlich wie Hurricane Francis wird Jean mit Windgeschwindigkeiten von bis zu 170 Kilometern in der Stunde über die Ostküste Floridas hereinbrechen. So etwas haben wir seit Beginn der Wetteraufzeichnungen in Florida nicht mehr erlebt, bestätigt das internationale Hurricane Zentrum. Schon jetzt sind Milliarden Schäden entstanden. Dass jemals ein US-Bundesstaat in so kurzer Zeit viermal von einem Wirbelsturm getroffen wurde, hat es zuletzt 1886 in Texas gegeben. Und vom Meer her rast Jean heran. Den Norden Haitis hat sie für lange Zeit ins Elend gestürzt. Über 1000 Tote, viele noch immer nicht gefunden. Heute Nacht fällt Jan über Florida her. Für Hunderttausende dort ist es die vierte Evakuierung schon in zwei Monaten. Sie horten Trinkwasser, Lebensmittel und Benzin in Amerikas Sonnenscheinstaat. Vier Tropenstürme so kurz hintereinander, das ist ein trauriger Rekord für Florida. Entnervt und niedergeschlagen warten sie jetzt auf die Nacht, die wieder einen Hurricane bringen wird. Ich mache mir nicht so große Sorgen, aber man muss natürlich auf alles vorbereitet sein. Auf den Bahamas tobt er schon, der Tropensturm. So sah das vor ein paar Stunden aus. Noch sind nicht alle Stromleitungen repariert, die das letzte Unwetter zerstört hatte. 70.000 Menschen mussten wochenlang ohne Elektrizität leben. Und jetzt könnte wieder alles zerschlagen werden. Sie sind die ärmsten Opfer des Sturms, der Haiti in ein schlimmes Chaos gestürzt hat. Die meisten Menschen hier haben seit einer Woche kaum etwas zu essen und kein sauberes Trinkwasser bekommen. Immer schwieriger wird die Arbeit der Hilfskräfte. Plünderer dringen in ihre Lebensmittellager ein. Bei der Verteilung kommt es inzwischen schon zu solchen Szenen. Soldaten der UN-Friedenstruppen müssen Warnschüsse abgeben, um die verzweifelten Hungrigen aufzuhalten. 
Und die Hilfsgüter haben noch längst nicht alle Bedürftigen erreicht. Viele Straßen, die sowieso schon in schlechtem Zustand waren, sind völlig zerstört oder immer noch überflutet. Die Vereinten Nationen haben mehr Blauhelmsoldaten in die Stadt Gonaiv geschickt. 300.000 Menschen sind hier obdachlos und völlig auf Hilfe von außen angewiesen. Eben in den nächsten Tagen, der eine bringt hier ein bisschen Regen, morgen und heute Nacht so bis zu den Alpen später. Sein Zentrum liegt hier oben bei Norwegen. Und der zweite, Karl, der wird uns auch noch ein bisschen am Montag beschäftigen, aber nicht sehr doll. Er bringt sehr viel Regen hier nach Norwegen und dann eben auch Wind- und Sturmböen wahrscheinlich noch. Sonst haben wir viel Regen am Mittelmeer in Italien, aber auch in Teilen Griechenlands, wobei es im Osten da noch sehr warm bleibt. Sie haben eben gesagt, um die 30 Grad sind es dort, aber da, wo es eben regnet, nur um die 20 auch in Italien, auf dem Balkan und die Wärme weiterhin auch in Portugal und Spanien. Sonst kühl, ja, das muss man sagen, herbstlich 10 bis 15 Grad und das kriegen wir auch so schnell erstmal wohl nicht los. Ja, noch ein Bild vom Hurrikan, vom Wirbelsturm Jeanne, der ja jetzt dann in der Nacht zum Sonntag auch Florida erreichen wird. Jetzt liegt er genau über den Bahamas und er wird letztendlich mit Windgeschwindigkeiten bis zu 220 Kilometer in, in der Stunde dann auch die Küste Floridas erreichen. Und dann weiter Richtung Nord-Nordwesten über Amerika hinwegziehen, wahrscheinlich dann wieder raus auf den Atlantik. Ja, das war's vom Wetter. Ich wünsche Ihnen einen schönen Abend und machen Sie es gut. John Zarella ist in West Palm Beach, not far from where the hurricane made landfall. John, tell us more. Shihab, we're on the uh, the south side of where the hurricane made landfall, and uh, um, in the last hour or so, it has uh, decreased in intensity here considerably. Still. Heavy rains and gusty winds, uh, but not the, the intense rain and wind that we had seen earlier in the evening when the rain was blowing sideways and the wind was kicking up to hurricane force here. Now, of course, this area was hit just three weeks ago to the day from Hurricane Francis. This hurricane, much more powerful, sustained winds came ashore at 120 miles an hour just to the north of us, and north of us uh, about 100 miles in the Melbourne area, which is not far from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, they are getting pounded now uh, with relentless wind and rain, the kind of thing that we saw earlier this evening uh, as the, the storm made landfall to our north about 40 or 50 miles to the north of us. Now, the power company here, Florida Power and Light Company, uh, report already over 800,000 customers without electricity tonight here in what is known as the Treasure Coast. Almost half a million of those right here in Palm Beach County without power. And, you know, the terrible uh, tragedy and all that is that uh, they had just restored power to this area, uh, which was hit again three weeks ago by Hurricane Francis, and now it's all been knocked out one more time. In fact, uh, this hurricane uh, Hurricane Jean came ashore in just about the exact location that Hurricane Francis made landfall in a spot called Sewell's Point, again about 40 or 50 miles to the north of us. Uh, lots of uh, expected to be structural damage further to the north, and uh, you know, there are all over this area, Shehab, people that have blue tarps on their roofs. Uh, which are covering holes in their roofs that were sustained in the last hurricane. And certainly with all of those tarps probably blowing off tonight, uh, adding insult to injury to those folks, uh, more bad weather, more rain pouring in uh, in already leaky roofs. And so now they're getting another dose of damage to what they sustained three weeks ago here from a storm that was not as powerful as this hurricane uh, has been tonight. And again now, we've been going through these squalls and these rains since about uh, 8 o'clock Eastern time last night. So we're looking at about seven hours of uh, being hammered by these relentless winds and rain. And again, this is considerably less, Shehab, than what we experienced over the course of the early evening hours last night till about midnight, uh, 2 a.m. Eastern time. It has considerably lessened up in the last hour. Shehab. Thank you, John. John Zarella reporting there. And before setting its sights on the U.S., Hurricane Jean ripped through the northwestern Bahamas. 185 kilometer per hour winds shredded rooftops and six feet of water covered some neighborhoods. Thousands took cover in shelters, although there are no reports of deaths due to the storm. The latest on Jean's path. Jill joins us from the Weather Center. Jill. 
Shiha, we are getting um, some reports of tornadoes sporadically, and that's a common thing when you have an, a landfalling tropical system. Maybe something that we deal with well into tomorrow, even as this is downgraded to a tropical storm, we could still have the threat of tornadoes. So it doesn't calm down, unfortunately, very quickly. So now Indian River County, and let me show you where that is. On the north side of circulation, you can see the brighter yellows in here, the strongest band of thunderstorms with heavy rain. Not only thunderstorms, but convection, and we do have uh, Doppler indicated possible tornado here so it's around the Vero Beach area and Blue Cypress Lake and Gifford Indian River Shores all the possibility of seeing this tornado go through anyone should be at this point in their safest room in their house anyway um, they will not most likely be getting these warnings what do they have they don't have power if they have a battery operated radio then that's their really their only hope so until this uh, hurricane goes farther inland, things calm down. Hopefully everyone is in the safest spot that they can be. You can see the eye of the hurricane moving inland now, so Fort Pierce down to St. Louis and uh, Stewart all getting the, the backside of the hurricane now. Winds have picked back up. Winds have not diminished yet, still 120 miles per hour, 193 kilometers per hour. The eye of the hurricane now is moving over Okeechobee County, so things will quiet down there for an hour, two hours perhaps, as this slowly makes its way to the west. So again, that's the latest update. Oh, new update has come in, 185 kilometers per hour. So it has weakened just a little bit. It's going to be slow to happen. Still a Category 3 could still most likely will be a hurricane as it crosses over Orlando. Here we go again, maybe 24 hours before we see this downgraded to a tropical storm. We're getting some gusts in Orlando right now, 78 kilometers per hour. So a gusty night, winds will pick up. Looks like the hurricane will cross over early tomorrow morning. And I believe that is uh, Melbourne reporting 107 kilometers per hour. The rain, of course, will be the next thing we start talking about. As the winds begin to weaken, we'll be still worried about tornadoes. We'll still be concerned about rain, perhaps for several days. Where you see the yellows and oranges, 150 millimeters to, or 75 to 150 millimeters, the red. 150 plus, this is only the beginning. We could see uh, several inches of rain out of this one. Some spots had had flooding before, waters have receded, folks are starting to clean up. Here we go again, and more damage in those same spots as well. So, rough time for Florida. We'll watch this as it makes its way up the East Coast across Georgia and the Carolinas. Shia, back to you. Da einer gefährlichen Sturmflut ist Hurricane Jeanne vor wenigen Stunden über die Ostküste Floridas hereingebrochen. Die ersten Konsequenzen, 270.000 Menschen sind ohne Strom. Die Bewohner einer Landzunge sind von der Außenwelt abgeschnitten. Weil Jeanne bei seinem Zerstörungszug durch die Karibik immer stärker und schneller geworden ist, rechnen die Behörden mit bis zu einer Million zerstörter oder beschädigter Gebäude und zigtausenden Obdachlosen. Hier auf den Bahamas zeigt sich die unglaubliche Kraft, die hinter Hurricane Jeanne steckt. Palmen knicken um wie Streichhölzer, kein Wunder bei 170 Stundenkilometern Geschwindigkeit. Und der Tropensturm nimmt stündlich an Stärke zu. In Florida sind drei Millionen Einwohner aufgefordert, sich in Sicherheit zu bringen. In dem bevölkerungsreichsten Bundesstaat Miami-Dade sind die Leute völlig erschöpft. Es ist das vierte Mal in nur zwei Monaten, dass hier die Menschen ihre Häuser verbarrikadieren müssen. Ich habe hier in Florida mein ganzes Leben gelebt und ich musste noch nie so etwas durchmachen. Es ist stressig, traurig und beängstigend. Viele unserer Freunde haben so viel Schaden an ihren Häusern und Geschäften. Es ist unbegreiflich. Die schreckliche Routine im Umgang mit Wirbelstürmen birgt aber auch Gefahren. Der Gouverneur von Florida, Jeb Bush, warnt. Ich hoffe, dass die Leute, die hier an der Küste leben, nicht denken, dass nach allem, was sie durchgemacht haben, sie auch diesen Hurricane überleben können und dann die Situation unterschätzen. Die Behörden sind besorgt, weil weit weniger Menschen als erwartet freiwillig ihre Häuser verlassen. Diese Gelassenheit kann für die Bewohner von Florida aber sehr gefährlich werden. Unterdessen stehen die Menschen in Haiti Schlange. Trinkwasser und Lebensmittel sind nach dem Hurricane Mangelware. Immer wieder kommt es zu Plünderungen der Hilfslieferungen. UN-Truppen versuchen das Chaos unter Kontrolle zu halten. Doch es gibt Probleme mit dem Nachschub. Das Rote Kreuz rechnet damit, dass Haiti noch monatelang auf ausländische Hilfe angewiesen ist.
It was the same nightmare all over again for the people of the east coast of Florida. Hurricane Jean made landfall in an area already devastated by another storm, Francis, three weeks ago. Its raging winds tore down trees and sent debris flying. The hurricane has also brought heavy rain and waves measuring seven meters high. Together, they're the ingredients for widespread flooding. Well, there's, it appears that, at least at first sight that uh, there's more damage than what was done during Francis. Um, we've seen a lot of roofs that have been taken off. We've seen um, a, lot, a lot of wires across the roadway and stuff. There's definitely much more flooding than what there was the last time around. Several of the streets are almost impassable. Floridian officials urge millions of people to leave the coast for evacuation shelters. But as the storm hit, many stayed at home, glued to the hurricane updates. The large eye of the hurricane is beginning to move on shore of Martin and St. Lucie County. And when they emerge, Floridians will find those winds have knocked out much of the electricity grid once again. The road system has also taken another battering, and the hurricane has ripped the roofs off a hospital and many homes. Go over here, my next door neighbor here lost probably about maybe a third of his roof, I'm guessing maybe about an hour ago. Flung over here, hit my house over here, and flung out here on the street. As the winds die down, the most dangerous time may be yet to come for those on the coast. Hurricane deaths often occur when people rush back to their homes without taking proper precautions. Before it hit Florida, Hurricane Jean roared through the Bahamas. Its winds brought high waves ashore on the islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama. Some districts were flooded with water one and a half meters deep, forcing hundreds of people to leave the shelters. The severe winds damaged homes and businesses. Fortunately, the Bahaman authorities say they have had no reports so far of casualties. In Florida kennt man das Spiel. Daran gewöhnen will man sich immer noch nicht. Es ist der vierte Hurricane in sechs Wochen. Immerhin die Barrikaden werden professioneller, abnehmbarer Wellblechschutz statt vernageltem Holz. I'm tired, exhausted, ich bin müde, abgenervt, ausgelaugt, sauer. Das Geld geht zu Ende. This is a special late edition. Hurricane Jean hits Florida. This is definitely the worst we've seen so far. Oh, wow. oh my God. Tracking Hurricane Jean. We'll get the latest on the storm and its unexpected turn. What's next in her path? Sometimes it feels like this is a test of resiliency for our state. Other times I feel like I'm Bill Murray in Groundhog's Day. The fourth hurricane to hit Florida in six weeks. The nation's emergency management director will join us. We'll get the latest from officials assessing damage in the hardest hit areas. Plus our CNN reporters deployed all across the state with the most up-to-date information. Mr. President, Iraqis, thank God, thank America, and thank our allies. Well, Saddam is one. A grateful ally visits the United States with an upbeat assessment. But is Iraq on the path to peace? Or civil war. A special interview with the U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell. And the Democratic response from Senator Joe Biden. Live from CNN in Washington, this is Late Edition with Wolf Blitzer. It's noon in Washington and Florida, 9 a.m. in Los Angeles, 8 p.m. in Baghdad, wherever you're watching from around the world. Thanks very much for joining us for this special three-hour late edition Hurricane Jean hits Florida. We're following every angle of this hurricane, a storm for the history books. It's the fourth hurricane to hit Florida in a single year that's never happened before. We're going to be talking with CNN reporters covering Gene in just a moment. First, though, let's get a quick check of the very latest now in the news. Gene is losing some strength as it moves across Florida. It's now closing in on the Tampa area. It slammed into Hutchinson Island, Florida, around midnight and continues moving toward the Gulf of Mexico. Officials in Florida say more than a million customers, maybe a million and a half customers already, have lost power, and that number expected to climb. More than 40,000 people are staying in shelters after mandatory and voluntary evacuation orders were issued for over 30 Florida counties. Mostly minor injuries, fortunately, so far being reported 
As far as Gene is concerned, in the United States, one person was electrocuted in Miami after touching a downed power line. Officials, though, have not confirmed that death was caused by the storm. Gene's winds and storm surge lashed the Bahamas before hitting Florida. No deaths or serious injuries were reported there, but some neighborhoods were submerged under six feet of water. Storm survivors prepared for church in Haiti this morning. Jean's force there killed at least 1,300 people and left 300,000 without homes. Uruguay is sending troops to help UN peacekeepers prevent mobs from storming relief workers. A full emergency was declared as an Olympic Airlines flight was diverted to London Stansted Airport earlier today. British military jets, tornadoes, scrambled to escort the Athens to New York flight to London Airport. The London Airport, an official for the Great Ministry of Public Order, said the flight was diverted due to what's being called a bomb scare. An airport spokeswoman says the flight landed for security reasons. All passengers exited safely. We're all over the story. We'll get more information to you as it becomes available. But more of our in-depth in -depth coverage now of Hurricane Jean as, it's, as it makes its way across Florida. Today, the eye of the hurricane came just south of Orlando, Florida, bringing high winds and very heavy rains to that tourist city. Seeing as Eric Phillips is there, he's weathering this storm. Eric, give us the latest. Well, Wolf, we've been out here since about 6 o'clock this morning, and what we were experiencing then and what we're experiencing now are really two different things. Back then, we were seeing strong gusts of wind coming through every 15, 20, 25 minutes. But as the hours have gone on, we've seen these strong gusts associated with very heavy pounding rain coming through every five minutes or so. We're here not far from Walt Disney World, and I can show you behind me as the trees have been waving in the breeze, you can tell how much of this wind they've had to withstand. I'm here at a hotel that has this pond, and you can just tell the way that the waves are even building, and a pond that is normally just standing still, that we're not talking about any normal uh, rainfall or any normal Normal wind that would be uh, coming through this area. On my wind gauge just a few minutes ago, I measured a wind speed of about 57 miles an hour, which falls in line with what emergency management officials have been telling us that they've been seeing here in the area, anywhere between 50 and 70 miles an hour, they're telling us. Uh, as far as power outages here in Orlando are concerned, those are sporadic right now. We're told about 130,000 people are without power here in the Orlando Orange County area and that most of those power outages are in the south end of the county. Of course, the storm has taken a turn that was not expected by many forecasters. So folks here in Orlando really had braced for the storm. They had braced for the worst, thinking that it would come right along the Atlantic coast, hitting this area with uh, hurricane force winds. That didn't happen. But officials want to emphasize that just because that didn't happen doesn't mean that we should not take Hurricane Gene, continue to take Hurricane Gene very seriously. They're telling folks to please be mindful of the curfew that's in place. That is a curfew that will be in place until 5 o'clock this evening. Officials are saying after the storm passes over and they've had an opportunity to come out and survey the damage, they may shorten that curfew. But at, that's, at this point, it remains until 5 o'clock this evening. And those who are evacuated, those in mobile homes and in manufactured homes, Homes who were under a mandatory evacuation are being cautioned to please not go back to their place of residence. And authorities are very serious about this. In fact, if anyone is out on the street driving or walking while this mandatory curfew is in place, they run the risk of being arrested. And authorities are saying that if they are arrested, they will not be eligible for bond. So they're taking the situation very seriously, they say, for the safety of the public. Well, Good advice. Uh, well, and, uh, well done indeed. Uh, thanks, Eric Phillips. We'll be getting back to you in Orlando, and later we'll be speaking with the mayor of Orlando as well. Four hurricanes battering Florida in six weeks. That's keeping federal emergency efforts key to that state. Joining us now from Miami, the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Michael Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown, thanks as usual for joining us. First of all, the big picture, how devastating is this? Well, it's devastating to everyone that's in the path of the storm, Wolf. When you think about it, there are some folks in, Flo in Florida who have been hit one, two, and possibly three times. Four, four hurricanes throughout this state uh, means that there are a lot of people suffering. Uh, we've gone from what I worried about, hurricane amnesia, to now hurricane fatigue. Are you ready? Is FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, ready to deal with this new hurricane? 
We absolutely are. We have all the manpower and resources we need. Uh, President Bush has been a very great supporter of FEMA. He's assured me uh, that we'll get all the resources we need to respond uh, as Hurricane Jean now makes her way up through those other states that will be impacted uh, just like Florida has been. Charlie, Francis, Ivan, now Jean. I suspect FEMA is still deeply engaged in, in dealing with those three earlier hurricanes, let alone this one, which is still unfolding. Is that true? That's true, and that's one of the frustrating things that's going on right now is we move into an area to do our recovery efforts, and we have to pull back because we don't want our workers to become victims. So we have to relocate them and then move them back in after the storm. The other thing that's happening, which is very frustrating at times, is we might start clearing out debris in one area, not be quite finished clearing out the debris, and then the storm blows in, spreads the debris all over the place again. How much money are we talking about, the damage so far, certainly the damage before Gene? Well, clearly billions of dollars. Uh, we, we've been so busy doing our response and recovery efforts, trying to get assistance to folks in Florida and all up and down the East Coast, that we haven't tallied it up yet. But we know we've already registered through these four storms about 400,000 victims or more. We've already dispersed just two individuals well over half a billion dollars. So you can see that when you count that, plus just the economic damage and the business losses and everything else, these are very, very costly storms. When you do your annual budgets and you worry about hurricanes, natural disasters, Mr. Brown, did you, did you forecast anything along these lines? No, we did not. We normally uh, have, a, we have a pretty steady budget figure we use every year, which is based on a 10-year average plus one big storm. This year, we need to change that budget average, increase it, and start counting for three or four big storms. Michael Brown, uh, the director of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, good luck to you. All the men Thank and you. women who work with you, thanks very much for all your good Thank work. Thank you. Hurricane Jean is covering much the same ground pounded by Hurricane Francis just three weeks ago. Daytona Beach certainly feeling the effects of Jean right now. Keith Oppenheim filed this report moments ago. Unfortunately, we don't have that report. We will get that report and bring it to you. Keith Oppenheim, our reporter on the scene in Daytona Beach. We're following all these developments, but let's take a look and see where Hurricane Jean is right now, seen as Jackie Jarris monitoring all those developments from the CNN Weather Center. Jackie? Well, Wolf, it's about 20 miles away from Tampa right now. This is the advisory at the 11 o'clock hour. There you can see 30 miles away, but it's moving about 10 miles per hour, so now it's about 20 at this time. It is moving up to the west-northwest at 10 miles per hour, so it has slowed down a little bit. We're a little bit concerned about that, but still the forecast has it accelerating a little bit as it takes more of a northerly turn. Barely a hurricane. Maximum winds right now at 75 miles per hour. However, we do expect that to be downgraded to a tropical storm later on this afternoon. So far, we've had uh, very few reports of tornadoes, not a lot of tornadic activity, but for Flagler County right now, there is a tornado warning in effect uh, spotted by Doppler radar, so we actually haven't seen any ground truth on this right now, but tornado activity will possibly increase a little bit this afternoon as things become a little bit more unstable at this time as these feeder bands continue to push in across the area. You can see we had a little shear marker on that one and that one has faded away so hopefully uh, we won't see anything drop out of that one at this time. There is a tornado watch which remains in effect across central and northern Florida even extending up into uh, southern Georgia uh, throughout the afternoon for today. Now I want to show you what you can expect uh, for the continued forecast track here with Gene. We're expecting to be kind of scraping along the west coast of Florida continuing to weaken. The good news is even if it makes its way back over open water, we don't expect it to strengthen anymore. It will likely stay down to a tropical storm through today, making possibly a second landfall overnight for tonight and then curving back up towards Charlotte into the Carolinas, spreading more rainfall so they may see some more flooding into the higher elevations of the Carolinas on the order of three to six inches. Well, so basically right now we're waiting for it to the eye to hit Tampa or near Tampa. Is that right, Jackie? It, it's going to be to the north of Tampa, Wolf. It's moving west-northwest, so it's really, Tampa's kind of in that inner core right now, but the worst of the winds are actually well to the north and to the east of the Tampa Bay area right now. The center is right around the Lakeland area. It's just kind of up to the north and west of Winter Haven, if you know where that is. Uh, I know exactly where that is. I've been down there several times, but the, the, the point is it's going to then hit, head out toward the Gulf of Mexico, go over the Gulf of Mexico, and then hit inland uh, in the Pan handle 
Is that the general course where it's going to go? Yeah, it looks that way. Uh, if you remember, France has hit about St. Mark's. We think it's going to be just off to the east of there as a tropical storm. So you are going to have some storm surge here, uh, maybe two to four feet, uh, possibly pushing up to six feet. Also seeing that heavy rain right within that path, five to ten inches, still possible in the track here, Wolf. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of potential water. That's mm -hmm. a lot of problems, of course, for everyone in its path. Jackie Jarris will be checking back with you clearly throughout this day. Uh, let's go to Daytona Beach. Keith Oppenheim is our reporter there on the scene, and only a few minutes ago he filed this report. Wolf, the weather here has been consistently wild for the past four or five hours. Even though we are uh, several counties north of where some of the worst damage was as Hurricane Jean hit shore, as you can see from the surf in the distance, we have been getting uh, high winds as well as damaging surf, which is going to cause a lot of beach erosion and also some other potential damage as you go inland uh, from Daytona Beach and in Volusia County. With me right now is Steve Dorsey, who is the manager of the Plaza Resort and Spa. And Steve, I think what's really noteworthy here is that this is the third out of the four hurricanes that you have experienced right here in Daytona Beach. Yes, sir. We've had all three. We had the Eye of Charlie come over the storm. Then we had Francis, now Gene, coming through here. So uh, what's it been like? Has it been frustrating? Do you find that you start making repairs and then the repairs get damaged? That's been the biggest problem is we try to get it. From the one storm, you do a little work and try to get things done, and the next storm comes right on top of that than the last one. So hopefully this will be it, and uh, we'll be back to normal here in no time. But on this storm, did you notice at all that some people were not heeding warnings, at least in the general area, that they tended to say, okay, I've had enough, I'm just not going to go anywhere? It seemed that way with the mandatory evacuation, especially for Francis. The streets were bare early in the day, and last night it seemed late into the evening before the curfew hit, before the streets were actually empty. Uh, how about yourself? Are you holding up or do you come to a point of just emotional exhaustion with the whole thing? We have a, uh, we put a, a small management skeleton crew on property during this time period so we can just keep an eye on the hotel for anything that might occur. So everyone kind of takes shifts taking care of everything. Make sure we take care of y'all. Steve Dorsey, thanks very much Thank and we appreciate the good uh, care that we're getting here. Unfortunately, this hotel took a bit of a hit just about a, an hour or two ago where a window uh, was smashed through, smashed through by the high winds. So in Volusia County, for the most part, there hasn't been major damage, but the damage that people are experiencing here is where they were trying to make repairs from two of the previous hurricanes. Tough stuff. Wolf, back to you. Keith Oppenheim, thanks very much. Keith reporting from Daytona Beach. We'll be checking in with him, with him throughout the day as well. Up next, we'll speak live with the mayor of Orlando, Florida, that city, taking a beating right now from Gene's heavy rains and high winds. Our special late edition covering Hurricane Gene. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Late Edition, our special coverage of Hurricane Jean. It's been a very tough six weeks, almost unbelievable for the residents of Florida. First, there was Hurricane Charlie, then Francis, then Ivan, and now Jean. The eye of Jean moved just south of Orlando earlier today. Joining us now on the phone is the mayor of that beautiful city, Buddy Dyer. Mr. Mayor, thanks very much for joining us. Set the scene for us. What happened uh, in your community? Well, uh, this is the third hurricane event we've experienced in the last six weeks, and I'm actually, I apologize for the wind, but I'm out doing some damage assessment right now, and it doesn't look as severe as Charlie and Francis was coming through, but we haven't finished with the rain and the wind that we're going to have here today, but quite honestly, a lot of the tree canopy had been cleared out during the first two hurricanes, and there wasn't as much left to knock down, I suppose. Does it look like the worst of Gene has already gone through Orlando, or are you sure. bracing for, for worse? No, I, I think the worst of Gene has already moved through our community. I know uh, the West Coast over the Tampa area is still going to get hit with more of Gene, but we're on the tail end of it, and we've actually got some of our crews out clearing some of the street, the tree, trees that have fallen in roadways uh, between some of the final bands we're getting. So tell our viewers what's happening now. Is it still raining heavily? Is it very windy, or has that died down as well? Uh, we're still probably getting gusts in the 25 to 30 mile an hour range, and then we have uh, pockets of rain. It's raining pretty hard right now. I'm actually standing under a little ledge, so I'm not being 
rained on, but um, we're going to continue to get severe weather through probably the rest of the daylight hours today. Elsewhere in Florida, maybe a million homes, a million and a half homes are without power. What about in Orlando? Uh, probably about a third of our residents are without power. It took us probably a week to ten days to restore power. Days after Francis, and this is more like Francis. We think we'll have power stored in two or three days. What do you need that you don't have to deal with the recovery? Well, we're, we're going to have to bring additional linemen in, again, from different parts of the country. And, of course, everybody's been stretched and stressed for the last six weeks dealing with recovery. But really what we're looking for is a resilience of our citizens, and everybody has been extremely cooperative in heeding emergency advice. We had had some concerns about people being complacent, but for the most part, they have uh, heated emergency advice. We've had a curfew in effect, and they're very... When do you think the airports uh, in Orlando, the, uh, uh, the, the parks, the theme parks, everything else will get back to business as usual? I don't know whether they will tomorrow or not. I anticipate that at some point tomorrow the airport will open. Uh, the theme parks are obviously closed today, and I don't know of their plans for tomorrow or Tuesday. So right now you're basically, a, 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 it sounds, Mr. Mayor, like you're breathing a little bit easier. It could have been much worse, at least in Orlando. When we went to bed last night, we were anticipating a direct hit in Orlando, and the path of the storm was more Francis-like and ended up being uh, a little bit south of us, so we didn't end up with a direct hit. We certainly got severe rain and, and winds, but I'm not sure we even actually experienced hurricane force winds here this time. Well, that's at least encouraging uh, for your community. Uh, Mr. Mayor Buddy Dyer, the mayor Thank of Orlando, has got his hands full despite the relatively good news we were hearing from him. Good luck to you. Good luck to all the people in Orlando. Earlier, uh, one of our affiliate reporters in Vero Beach, Florida, filed this report. As Hurricane Jean continues to move away from uh, South Florida, you can still see that the gusts are still battering us as we finally are able to say goodbye to this awful storm. It was quite a different story last night as the howling winds did a lot of damage throughout this area. We were one of the first crews that were out to be able to look at the damage right at sunrise. And what we saw was a lot of damage done to a lot of flooding from the storm surge. Also, roofs that were already damaged from Hurricane Francis did not hold up with the little patches that they had onto them to the hurricane strength winds that they endured last night. A lot of the blue tarps that were already on them had blown off completely. More water coming in and even more roofs peeling off. There's also a report uh, in the middle of the storm that a car was trying to go over the South Bridge over to the Barrier Island in Fort Pierce last night when high winds literally tipped it over to the side. The Coast Guard is looking into it. They say that there are marks on the side of the bridge and possibly that uh, a car was flipped over into the intercoastal. A missing person report has been filed last night. Again, police are now looking into that. They're also telling people to stay inside their homes. Even though that the storm is starting to die down, people want to come out and try and see the damage, but it is still very dangerous with live wires everywhere trees down and also the flooding. People are ignoring the curfew though and going out and trying to see as much as they can. Police are trying to curtail that, asking the media to tell everyone to get back into their homes. They're also driving around the streets telling people to go home if they see them and they have been arresting people. As far as damage that we've seen, it is uh, not as comparable as that uh, we've seen with Hurricane Francis that hit us three weeks ago. The preliminary uh, damage reports show that uh, we fared a little bit better in the uh, inland in South Florida than we did with Hurricane Francis. Some of the people were telling me uh, that possibly the weaker structures, the weaker trees uh, may have been blown down by Francis and Gene just came in and cleaned up what was left. Right now there is a long road of recovery ahead. Almost everyone in our area is without power right now and the power companies are telling us we probably will be in the dark for three weeks. That's going to be a very long time without power, without hot showers, and most importantly in South Florida, without air conditioning. For now, reporting in Vero Beach, Eric Roby, back to you. For our special late edition, I'm Will Flitzer reporting. We're covering extensively Hurricane Gene.
Florida faces more weary days ahead after the state's latest encounter with a major hurricane. Gene slammed ashore late last night near Stewart on Florida's east coast with winds of 120 miles an hour. After pounding the coast with heavy surf, high winds, and torrential rain, it swept inland across the central Florida pen peninsula. It's expected to move toward the state's panhandle after sweeping through the Tampa Bay area this afternoon. Here's some of the damage Gene left behind in the Bahamas as it made its way to Florida. The storm lashed two of the major islands in the chain, Grand Bahama and Abuco. Welcome back to Late Edition special coverage of Hurricane Jean. It grazed the West Palm Beach area overnight for residents there dealing with storms of such magnitude. Unfortunately, has become a regular occurrence at least this hurricane season. Joining us now on the phone is the mayor of West Palm Beach, Lois Frankel. Mayor, thanks very much for joining us. I think relatively speaking, you, you guys were lucky in West Palm. Is that right? Yeah, you know, I don't know whether to say we're unlucky or lucky. Uh, it, uh, to get two hurricanes like this three weeks apart is not lucky, but we are really blessed that uh, we came out as well as we did. I drove the city this morning, and we really look pretty good. Are people getting back to business as usual in, in the West Palm area, or are they still in their homes? It was very quiet this morning. I think people were exhausted, and they slept in. I expect this afternoon if the... Uh, rain stays away, people will be back out and uh, moving the debris again onto the sides of the street. Has the rain and the wind died down dramatically, at, at least now in West Palm? Yes, it, it was howling last night. I mean, we were really being hammered, and it's very quiet right now. What about all those beautiful homes in Palm Beach uh, along the Atlantic Ocean? What happened, as far as you know, to a, a lot of the, the structures along the ocean? I have not heard yet. There was a curfew, and then actually there was an evacuation order, and I do not believe anybody's been allowed to go back over there yet, uh, probably other than just their police and the utility workers. So uh, we'll be waiting for some reports there. Most of the, a lot of the damage you will you learn about after people go back to their homes. What about the airports and power? What's the status? Airports still close. We lost, again, uh, about a million homes lost electricity as a result uh, of the storm last night. About half those homes are in Palm Beach County, and we've been told that's going to be a long haul, uh, maybe in three weeks till we get electricity. And that was really the hard part of our last hurricane because it's still so hot in Florida. Uh, we, we, like most people going into winter, well, we're still just at the tail end of our summer, and so it's been pretty brutal. Are you saying, Mayor, that uh, it's going to be three weeks before power is restored in West Palm Beach? Well, that's what, that's what Florida Power and Light has told us. This has been such an unusual season here in Florida. Uh, we've had millions of people lose electricity. They've had to bring uh, workers from all over the country, uh, utility workers from all over the country, in order to restore power. And it's, here's what happens. Every time they get a community restored, another hurricane comes along. And... Their workers apparently are very tired, they've been stretched thin, and I don't know whether they're just lowering our expectations or they're telling us this is the way it's going to be. So th 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 there are hundreds of thousands of people at West Palm Beach and the entire area of Palm Beach County. How many people are we talking about? Well, right now there are about a million homes that are out without power as a result of Hurricane Jean. Uh, but as we speak, I know this storm is still traveling through our state, so I'm going to expect that that number is going to go much higher than that. So it's a moving target. Uh, in the meantime, I expect we're going to be dark here for two to three weeks. One final question. No curfews or anything like that, in, at least in West Palm Beach. Is that right? We, do ha we had a curfew uh, that was put in effect for the entire county. Uh, there will be a uh, conference at 1 o'clock today. With, uh, with county officials, and a decision will be made. But because uh, it's going to be very, very dark tonight, power out, I would expect that, at least for tonight, in order to prevent looting and some bad car accidents, that, that we probably will have the curfew, which will be 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
All right, uh, the Lois Frankel, the mayor of West Palm Beach. Good luck to you. Good Thank luck you. to all, you, all the people in your community. Thank you. Mit voller Wucht hat Hurricane Jan in der Nacht die Küste von Florida getroffen, und zwar genau dort, wo gerade erst der Wirbelsturm Francis gewütet hatte. Jan ist bereits der vierte Hurricane in sechs Wochen, der den US-Bundesstaat trifft, und viele Menschen haben die Warnungen gar nicht mehr ernst genommen. Eine lebensgefährliche Einstellung. Aus den USA, Ulrich Obholt. Zehn Minuten vor Mitternacht bricht Hurricane Jan über Florida herein. Orkanböen mit Tempo 180 Peitschen, Schutt und Trümmer durch die Luft und auch Reporter des amerikanischen Fernsehens. Transformatoren explodieren, Strommasten knicken um, mehr als eine Million Menschen sitzen im Dunkeln. Alles, was sie hören, ist das laute Heulen des Orkans mitten in der Nacht. Hurricane John verwüstet die gleiche Region an der Ostküste Floridas wie vor drei Wochen Francis. Besonders schlimm sieht es heute früh in Vero Beach aus. Meterhohe Flutwellen haben hier diese Siedlung überschwemmt. Das Meer hat hunderte Meter Land geschluckt. Vero Beach ist vorübergehend eine Insel im Atlantik. Die meisten Menschen hier hatten sich zuvor in Sicherheit gebracht. Noch haben die Behörden keine genauen Angaben über Tote oder Verletzte. Nur so viel steht jetzt schon fest. Wieder hat der Wirbelsturm tausende Häuser beschädigt oder ganz zerstört. Nach einer ersten groben Schätzung rechnen Versicherungsexperten erneut mit Milliardenschäden, vor allem durch die Sturmflut. Die Schäden sind größer als bei Francis, vor allem weil so viele Stromleitungen zerstört sind und es gab definitiv mehr Überflutungen. Hurricane John hat Kleinflugzeuge durch die Luft gewirbelt und zieht zur Stunde weiter Richtung Norden. Inzwischen hat er etwas an Kraft verloren. Allein bis die Stromleitungen wieder repariert sind, kann es bis zu drei Wochen dauern. Floridas Gouverneur Jeb Bush versprach schnelle Hilfe. Er bat seinen Bruder, den Präsidenten, die Küstenregion zum Katastrophengebiet zu erklären, um damit zusätzliche Bundeshilfe für die notleidende Bevölkerung zu bekommen. In sechs Wochen, die Menschen in Florida sind sturmerprobt, aber so etwas hat man selbst hier seit Menschengedenken nicht mehr erlebt. Und jetzt auch noch Jeanne. In der Nacht traf der Sturm auf die Küste. Hunderttausende sind nun ohne Strom, viele Häuser zerstört. Es war kurz vor Mitternacht, als Hurricane John mit sintflutartigen Regenfällen und voller Wucht an Land ging. Über dem Meer hatte er noch an Stärke zugelegt, dann raste er über Florida hinweg. Genau vor drei Wochen hatte Hurricane Francis die gleiche Gegend verwüstet. Der Schaden ist wesentlich größer als damals bei Francis. Viele Dächer wurden abgedeckt, Stromkabel gekappt. Und die Überflutungen sind eindeutig schlimmer als beim letzten Mal. Über eine Million Häuser wurden beschädigt. Die Behörden hatten die Bevölkerung vorher aufgefordert, sich in Sicherheit zu bringen. Doch viele sind das Risiko eingegangen und zu Hause geblieben. John ist der vierte Hurricane dieser Saison und die Menschen sind Hurricane müde und frustriert. Wieder müssen Hunderttausende wochenlang ohne Strom auskommen. Ich bin zum ersten Mal zu Hause geblieben während eines Hurricanes und ich hatte wirklich Angst, auch vor all dem Schutt, der durch die Luft fliegt. Bei meinem Nachbarn ist ein Teil des Daches weggerissen worden. Es flog hier rüber, hat mein Haus getroffen und knallte dann auf die Straße. Inzwischen ist Jan herabgestuft worden auf einen Wirbelsturm der niedrigsten Kategorie 1. Und auch die Nachtreporter der amerikanischen Fernsehanstalten sind mittlerweile in Sicherheit und im Trockenen. Innerhalb von sechs Wochen eine Schneise der Verwüstung geschlagen. Der Wirbelsturm Jeanne deckte Dächer ab, zerstörte Stromleitungen und entwurzelte Bäume. Heftiger Regen löste Überschwemmungen aus. Mehr als eine Million Haushalte waren ohne Strom. Inzwischen hat der Sturm, der zuvor in der Karibik gewütet hatte, sich deutlich abgeschwächt. Man hat in Florida schwere Verwüstungen angerichtet. Mindestens vier Menschen kamen ums Leben. Nach ersten Schätzungen verursachte der Tropensturm Schäden von bis zu 8 Milliarden Dollar. Der Hurricane entwurzelte Bäume und deckte Dächer ab. Nach heftigen Regenfällen standen weite Gebiete unter Wasser. Selbst Flugzeuge wurden durch die Luft gewirbelt. Mehr als eine Million Haushalte waren ohne Strom. US-Präsident Bush erklärte Florida am Abend zum Katastrophengebiet. Pro Stunde ist er ja auf Florida gestoßen. Da liegt er jetzt auch über dem Nordwesten Floridas hier das Auge. Im Hintergrund die USA. Hier noch der Südzipfel Floridas gut zu erkennen. Aber inzwischen ist Jan deutlich schwächer geworden, wird nur noch als Sturm geführt. Die 
höchsten Windgeschwindigkeiten liegen heute Nachmittag unter 100 km pro Stunde. Das ist also nicht das Problem. Aber man muss sich ja so einen Hurrikan vorstellen wie einen rotierenden Schwamm, vollgesogen mit Wasser, mit Regenwasser, das er dann auf seinem weiteren Weg über den äußersten Osten der USA verlieren wird. Und so muss in den nächsten Tagen, in der gesamten Woche eigentlich noch, überall zwischen Atlantikküste und dem Höhenzug der Appalachen mit sintflutartigem Regen gerechnet werden. Hurricane Jeanne in Florida in den Tod gerissen. Er hinterlässt Schäden in Milliardenhöhe. Mehr dazu gleich. In Jeanne sind in Florida am Wochenende nach Behördenangaben mindestens fünf Menschen ums Leben gekommen. Es entstanden Milliarden Schäden. Jeanne ist bereits der vierte Wirbelsturm seit Mitte August, der den US-Bundesstaat heimsucht. Mit Windgeschwindigkeiten von mehr als 190 Stundenkilometern fegte er über Florida hinweg. Er zerstörte ganze Stadtteile und überschwemmte große Gebiete. Auf seinem Weg Richtung Norden verliert er jetzt an Stärke. Dennoch war Jeanne angeblich nicht so verheerend wie der Hurricane Ivan. Nun, äh, es wird wieder von Milliardenschäden gesprochen. Erste Hochrechnungen gehen von 6 bis 7 Milliarden aus. Wenn man die vier Hurricanes addiert, ergibt dies die Summe für Florida allein von irgendwo 26, 27 Milliarden Dollar. Das ist historischer Rekord. Auf der anderen Seite muss man natürlich feststellen, dass es für den einzelnen Betroffenen äh, gigantische Ausmaße annimmt. Hier wird man drei bis vier Wochen eine Million Menschen ohne Telefon, ohne Stromversorgung haben. Weite Teile des Landes sind überschwemmt. Äh, die Saison, vor allen Dingen für die Urlauber, scheint vorbei zu sein. Und ein weiteres Problem wird immer wichtiger für Florida Nämlich die Stranderosion. Zum Teil haben die Strände hier 15 bis 20 Meter verloren. Von daher ist der Staat, ist die Regierung gefordert. Und dies ist nicht kurzfristig beseitbar, sondern es wird lange dauern, bis diese Schäden beseitigt sind. Ja, die betroffenen Regionen sind jetzt Notstandsgebiete. Was bedeutet denn das konkret für den Wiederaufbau? Bedeutet, dass man Hilfe durch die Bundesregierung erhält. Hinzu kommt natürlich, wir befinden uns in einem Wahljahr. Florida ist sehr wichtig äh, und von daher wird natürlich Washington kräftig Geld in die Region pumpen. Aber dies hilft kurzfristig alles nichts, denn äh, vier äh, Hurricanes innerhalb von sechs Wochen machen deutlich, dass die Aufräumarbeiten insgesamt sicherlich sechs bis acht Monate dauern. Trotz alledem, äh, es ist erstaunlich, wenn man mit den Leuten hier spricht, viele sagen nun, wir hätten ganz gerne Pause von drei bis vier Wochen, aber wegziehen, nein, für uns bleibt Florida das äh, Sonnenparadies. Wir bleiben hier und wir trotzen auch den nächsten Hurricanes. Roger Honey in Fort Myers in Florida, vielen Dank für diese Einschätzungen zum Hurricane. Georgia. Er hat sich abgeschwächt, ist nur noch ein tropischer Sturm, bringt etwa so 90 km pro Stunde an Windgeschwindigkeit und hat in Georgia etwa 90 Liter Regen in den letzten 24 Stunden gebracht. Das war's für heute. This uh, view was recorded on board the station on Saturday. Again, as it uh, flew above uh, the area of Hurricane Jean, uh, Jean approaching uh, Florida and making landfall on it. On the east coast of Florida. Again, this uh, was from Saturday, and so the station flew uh, about 230 miles above Hurricane Jean.
also uh, during the weekend on uh, Sunday, yesterday afternoon, at the, near the end of his day, I think uh, called down to Mission Control as some of his observations of the hurricane at that time as it uh, was above Florida and uh, moving up uh, the peninsula. Houston Alpha on space to ground two. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, Greg, I was wondering, uh, well, I was wanting to let you know that uh, we took some pictures of the hurricane when we uh, flew over. They're available for downlink and under a folder named Hurricane. Well, there's other numbers and letters, but uh, it should be obvious to the OSCOs and the folks who download these things. And uh, also, Greg, I was wondering if you would be so kind to send me a um, a copy of the hurricane tracking chart. Uh, those come in handy when we're actually trying to, I mean, you can't miss it, but it's also helpful to, when I try to take photos of landmarks nearby, and it helps to know where I am. So the hurricane tracking chart really helps. Mike, that sounds great. Uh, we're downloading those images right now, and uh, we're getting that chart together for you, and we'll send that up. Sure, appreciate it. And Mike, uh, just a uh, heads up about uh, the hurricane. It's been downgraded to a tropical storm, by the way. And uh, uh, just reading the news here about it, there's about one and a half million people without power now. And um, But it uh, looks like it's weakening and heading kind of uh, north through the t Tampa area. Yeah, I was afraid it might uh, be headed to, into the uh, Gulf of Mexico again and it'll pick up stream. Uh, if it heads inland, it's bad for the people inland, but it definitely will take the punch out of the storm. I'm glad that uh, she's uh, a, a tropical uh, storm now, but even, yeah, and she doesn't have an eye anymore. You guys might have seen that, but still, it's a very well-formed uh, hurricane. And you'll see, if you haven't seen it on your on your video downlink, you'll you'll see the pictures. That yeah, sounds good. And you got some uh, incredible pictures yesterday. Um, on the line um, from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida is uh, the director for the Kennedy Space Center, Jim Kennedy and uh, the commander of the Air Force's 45th uh, Space Wing, General Select uh, Mark Owen. I'll take, uh, we'll go right now to uh, to Mike Ryan, and you can uh, start us off, and then we'll take questions afterwards. Thanks, Alan. We'll open up with uh, a statement from uh, Senator General Select Owen, and then uh, Mr. Kennedy, and then I'll throw it back to Alan for questions. Uh, Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to join with Mr. Kennedy today to update you on the status of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Patrick Air Force Base as a member of America's Spaceport. Thanks for the opportunity. I'd like to congratulate the people of Florida, Brevard County, and our teams here at the Spaceport for their resiliency in the wake of four hurricanes that have, been, that, that have had major impacts on our lives in less than two months' time here. I have to say I'm impressed with everyone's can-do spirit and resourcefulness. Those traits have helped us not only to serve each other, but the vital national space and range resources we are charged with maintaining and protecting. I look forward to a day, to a day when we can focus back on launching satellites again instead of dodging hurricanes. I'm happy to report that it appears that none of our personnel uh, or their family members were lost or injured during Hurricane Jean. We're in the process of making sure that our people and their families are taken care of in the wake of the storm. Their well-being their well uh, remains my top priority because they make our mission happen. Much like Francis, Jean left a widespread damage in both Patrick and the Cape. Uh, for us at, uh, at uh, Patrick and uh, less so at the Cape, we uh, sustained, we, we saw sustained 47 knot winds. They peaked at 56 knots. Everyone has a detector of fear in their mind, Howard. Now, because oil broke us. I'm sorry. Um, as I was saying, we, uh, we saw sustained 47 knot winds and with peak of 56 knots gusts. Uh, for, uh, and had 20 hours of gusts above 50 knots seen at Patrick Air Force Base and about 4.3 inches of rain at Patrick. And uh, like you already know, uh, the further south you went, the worse it got. We don't have any damage assessments for uh, Johnson Dickinson a missile test mechanics, but I have to tell you that uh, it, uh, it endured worse conditions than that. Our teams are assessing the damage, but I don't have any specific in terms of exactly how much, how many structures were damaged or to what extent. 
I will say that there are widespread instances of severely damaged roofs and water intrusion. Preliminary indications are that we did not lose or take major hits to any of our major critical facilities or systems, but support infrastructure took some beatings. Due to the space launch vehicles on the pads, the Delta II at Slick 17B, the Titan 4B at Slick 40, and the Delta IV Heavy at Slick 37 appear to have weathered the storm well. There's no visible damage was observed during the initial walk downs on the pads, but the, uh, the systems remain to be tested and the status of these three vehicles, however, looks good so far. It doesn't look like we took any major hits to our critical facilities on the Eastern Range instrumentation. Keep in mind, we still have to power up several systems to determine if they're mission capable. As I said, teams are conducting preliminary damage assessments at both bases. We don't have any damage estimates in terms of cost. We add about $33 million in damage from Hurricane Francis, and for which the command, specifically General Lord Air Force Base Command, sent us that money. We made great use of it in between the two hurricanes to prepare for Hurricane uh, Gene. And uh, we were still in the process of making many of those fixes when Gene struck. Uh, so uh, there is going to be wide-ranging estimates as far as the costs go uh, as a result of Gene. Hurricane's Gene impact or Eastern Range launch schedule remains to be determined. I think it's safe to say the Delta II GPS mission that was set for October 8th will probably be delayed, if for no other reason than just simply the lost time on the pad. In terms of our workforce, we are planning to issue an all-clear announcement for Patrick and the Cape tomorrow. However, uh, that is primarily so that our families living on base can return to their homes and mission essential personnel can return to their workstations immediately. We rely heavily on this general workforce to continue to help us prosecute, recover, and reconstitution actions. Um, the earliest we will, uh, that I anticipate having a, a normal day of work will be Wednesday. Closing, I'd like to say that uh, Gene's effects uh, for us were more severe than that of Francis, and uh, we see it mostly in our support versus our critical infrastructure. Our support infrastructure, we, uh, we use the, the taxpayers' money wisely in the 1960s and built really good quality facilities, and we've been maintaining them and sustaining them in a great fashion, and that's a testament to their contractor and our government workforce throughout the years. But when you take two hurricanes in less than 30 days' time, um, those old facilities have really knocked the, the, the paint and powder off of them, and they're really showing some, uh, they're not showing their best side these days. So we're in the process, frankly, of making some careful assessments on whether these facilities ought to be uh, ought to be abandoned and moved on to uh, new facilities, um, or how much we're going to invest in them to bring them up to uh, bring them up to standards. This is mostly a quality of life issue. Again, I want to emphasize that our support infrastructure and not our mission infrastructure. We're going to benefit from both the uh, move to EELV. Uh, we have two boosters: the uh, the Atlas Three and the Titan Four. I'm sorry, the Atlas Five. And the, and the Titan IV. I'm, I'm being, uh, being waved off. I'm getting this all mixed up. It's the Delta IV uh, that's, that's our last launch out of here. Uh, you guys are messing me up here. This is what I'm trying to say. We have a, we have a, we have a Titan IV that remains the last of the heritage vehicles, and then also then an Atlas III that remains the last of the heritage vehicle. And then we're going to be moving over to EELV. We're going to we're going to try to make sure that uh, the storms haven't taken the life out of those facilities, and then we're going to move them on to containment. Uh, so we're going to benefit in that regard as far as our launch infrastructure. As far as the range infrastructure goes, we're right in the middle of a, of a systematic remodernization or moderniz uh, modernization of those facilities. So that's also a blessing in disguise. But as I mentioned again, the support infrastructure what has my principal concern. But I'm very much relieved that our people are well and well taken care of, and we'll be back up in uh, in no time. Thanks very much for your offer, uh, for the opportunity to let you know what's going on at the Cape and Patrick. I'll turn it over here now to uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll start by thanking all of the reporters for your continued interest in what we have to tell you. I think my information will be a little less impressive to you than it was for Francis. And I'm just sitting here realizing how how much different a few miles can be. Uh, Colonel Owen told you that this hit for them was more serious than Francis. Uh, for us, Francis was definitely more serious.
terms of impact, and it's because we are 20 to 30 miles farther north than they are. So I have some specifics for you on that subject. I'd also like just to make another brief comment about the, uh, the partnership that we enjoy with the United States Air Force. It is a great partnership. We literally sat here together Saturday night and Sunday in what we call a ride-out crew, and it was an honor to, to share the launch control sign with our friends from the Air Force. And coming here to the press site, we just shared a helicopter ride to have first-hand view of, of the damage. So to all of you, Colonel Owen, thank you for thank you for your continued support. While the data I'm going to share with you this afternoon is limited, I will tell you that it's also preliminary and could change. The data primarily comes from the fact that we have had a damage assessment and response team. We call it the DART team. Uh, they have been deployed ever since uh, uh, initial uh, light this morning and have given us some, uh, some data to share with you. As I told you with Francis, and I can tell you again, the two most important priorities that I had uh, were met relative to survivability of Jane. The first one being no loss of life. We had no injuries and no loss of life of any employees or families of employees. We also had no loss of major flight hardware, including the Space Shuttle International Space Station and the vehicle ready to fly on our next expendable launch vehicle, the SWIFT program. I'd like to start with a couple of comparisons of weather to help you understand why, for us, a gene was less damaging. First of all, at the 12-foot level on the tower, which is what we call ground level, uh, we did not reach hurricane force winds in a sustained capacity. It takes 74 miles per hour uh, to be classified hurricane force, and yet we only had 54 mile an hour winds sustained uh, with gust to 64. So even our gust levels were below hurricane force winds. A little comparison at, a, at some higher levels, we take a, a, a tower reading at 54 feet and also one at 492. I call the 54-foot height with the typical office facility that we have at the Cape. I think that's why it's at that level. So if you think about yourself being on the top of the uh, OSB, our support building office space, uh, Francis had sustained winds of 68, while Gene only had sustained winds of 60. Francis had gust to 94, and Gene only had gust to 80. At the 495, at the 492 foot level, which is basically the top of the VAB, Francis had the same sustained winds, 82 miles per hour for both Francis and Jane. However, the gust, which I suspect were peeling panels off the VAB significantly more for Francis, the gust for Francis was 102 and only 93 for Jane. So, in addition to a kinder, gentler storm for us, we also have duration, which is a key consideration. 50 mile per hour winds, if you take that level of wind velocity, Francis had that level or greater for a day and a half, 36 hours, while Gene only had 50 knot winds or greater, 50 mile per hour winds or greater for 21 hours. Uh, rainfall, which is a key criteria for us because when you start ripping uh, ceilings off, water intrusion in your buildings becomes a dominant factor. Uh, rainfall for Francis was eight inches. Rainfall for us, for Jane, was only three inches. So all in all, it's definitely a kinder, gentler uh, kind of a storm for us. The VAB was got a lot of attention after Francis, which had lost a total of 820 panels. Again, a panel being four feet by 16 feet. Uh, we lost an additional 30 panels for a new total of 850. We had significant roof damage and water intrusion, some of it enveloped by damage that we saw from the previous storm. But the roof damage includes the facilities we talked extensively about after Francis, things like the PCC, the Process Control Center. Uh, the ONC facility, one of the older facilities at the Kennedy Space Center, has a lot of damage on the fifth floor roof, which is basically allowing water intrusion on all five of the floors uh, below that roof. So we have a lot of water intrusion, but I, I want to assure you it's nothing that we can't manage, and we will. The TPS facility, Thermal Protection System facility, was got a lot of discussion after Francis. You may recall that we moved all of the soft goods out of that facility because we lost the roof entirely. Uh, the flight hardware was exposed to the, to the elements for about three days. That equipment, as well as uh, flight hardware, has been relocated to the reusable launch vehicle hangar, called the RLV hangar. 
originally intended for the X-34 program, as I recall. And uh, that facility and hardware inside has been unharmed. So the combination of Charlie Francis and Gene leaves, was, leaves us with a great deal of facility repair work to deal with in the coming months. So we will do that. I want to read uh, a statement uh, so I get it precise uh, relative to return to flight dates because I know the media is most interested, as you should be and as we are, in that date. So let me, let me say the following. As for return to flight planning, Hurricane Jean is the latest event that we need to factor when examining the return to flight effort. At this point, working with the shuttle program, we will gather our data from Jean this week and combine it with the impacts we had already assessed relative to Charlie, Francis, and Ivan. Both Ivan 1 and Ivan 2 caused us some degree of difficulty. On Friday at the Johnson Space Center, where much of our agency leadership is already gathering for the Expedition 10 Flight Readiness Review, our impacts will be discussed by the Space Flight Leadership Council Executive Board. This includes Bill Reedy, Mike Kostelnik, Admiral Cantrell, all of the CODEM Center Directors, and Safety and Mission Assurance personnel. After this meeting, if changes to return to flight plans are needed, they will be, they will make that decision then. So, one last comment about the workforce. I know Carl Owen referred to what his intentions were. At KSC, we will be open beginning tomorrow first shift for a normal business day. Both NASA and the contractors will make provisions for those individuals who have family situations resulting from the storm. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mike. Yep, Howard, over to you. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, we'll start off uh, with a question and then a follow-up uh, as I call you off. Again, as a reminder to make sure we don't get any feedback on the line, please star six on your phone to mute. When, you, when I call on you, you then star six, unmute, and then you can talk. And star six again, please, so again, we don't get any feedback. Uh, we'll start off with Marcia Dunn, Associated Press. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, uh, Jim, I was wondering about the number of signals. I've been told previously that you lost maybe 38 to 40 from Charlie. And are you putting that into the A20 panel loss for Francis? I'm just getting, trying to get a final total tally yeah. from all three storms. Yeah, A20 is, is all storms leading up to and including Francis. 30 is the delta for Jean for a total of 850. Okay, thanks. And do you have any idea yet when you might be able to start repairing um, some of these panels and plugging the holes? Are you going to try to accelerate that now since there's not a depression out there that I can uh, see at least on the hurricane website? Yeah, Marsha, I, I won't say that we're trying to accelerate it more than we were before because we were trying to accelerate it from the time Francis uh, came blowing through. It's, it's something that, that has our highest priority and we are aggressively pursuing the solution. But uh, I do not have a, a good date for you. I can tell you that, that the week before uh, Gene, they did they did lower the spider cage uh, across now over the roof of the building and began to do the detailed assessment as well as tightening up where it's appropriate of the panels. So we give that a high priority, but I don't have an exact date for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Stefano Colvan, uh, Popular Mechanics. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Kennedy, what kind of repairs did you manage to, care to, to put in place uh, before uh, Jane showed up? What kind of so they can uh, What kind of repairs uh, did you manage to uh, make in the VAB before Jane showed up? Yeah, I, I would just say not just the VAB, but the repairs that we were able to do in the short time span between Francis and Jane were all temporary repairs. Some held uh, fairly well, some did not. I know that. Uh, I don't know if Mark's chopper flew over the top of the VAB, but we did. And one thing that I was interested to see is that the vents, which some of the vents were literally blown away uh, after Francis, and we're talking about big vents, 20 feet by 10 feet kind of vents, uh, we had covered those with a tarp and, and a substructure that hope it, with the hope of it, that it might stay in place, but indeed it did not. So when I think about the torrential downpour that we had and the gaping hole in the roof of the VAB, that's just an example of the fact that all of these fixes were different. It's the best we could do in the time that we had, hopefully before our next storm, which might be in 2005 or later, uh, we'll have some permanent fixes. But we had no permanent fixes in place uh, for Jim. Do you have a follow-up, uh, Stephanie? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News. Uh, yeah, hi, and I don't have a question today. Thanks. 
Sorry? Uh, Jeff Heck, New Scientist. Hi. Uh, did you have any uh, storm surge problems this time, or and how did it compare with uh, Francis? Yeah, uh, Mark, you may want to comment to this, too. I'll, I'll tell you that uh, we did not experience a lot of, uh, of surge. I, I did not hear an exact number, to be honest with you, uh, but we certainly had uh, uh, a lot of extensive beach erosion up and down the, the shore, getting progressively worse as you went south. And I would have to echo that uh, for Patrick Air Force Base in particular. Um, where we have so we have facilities right on the east side of A1A, substantial beach erosion in the uh, surf was right up to the edge of uh, sometimes the facility, and uh, we uh, suffered some extensive sand intrusion because the beach was blown right up from and was deposited right against buildings in many cases, and also with the attendant water surge. So we have to, at least in those facilities that are right on the uh, east side of A1A. They took extensive uh, sand and water intrusion from the sea. Okay. Any follow-up? No, that's the thing. Okay, uh, Jean-Louis Santini, AFP. Uh, no, thank you. No question. Okay, Brad Liston, Reuters. No questions, thanks. Okay, uh, Jeff Morris, Aerospace Daily. Uh, yes, Mr. Kennedy, I, I was just wondering, I, I realize the, obviously the, the impact of all of these things on return to flight scheduling is, is still being determined, as you, as you said, but I was wondering if you have any feel for maybe how much, you know, how much processing time has been lost as a result of, of these recent storms between all of the closings and, and the time that employees have had to spend, you know, weatherproofing instead of doing their, their normal jobs. Did you have any feel for that? Uh, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, we were literally, our employees were not on site for seven work days for Francis. And for Gene, they were not on site for two work days. As I said, we plan to go back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So for those two storm days, so two storms alone, there's nine work days. And, and Charlie was one, so there's a total of ten. And I will tell you that based upon our hurricane condition, we start taking precautionary numbers, uh, measures when we declare hurricane two, which is uh, event minus two days, so I'll say an average of two days per storm times three storms, it would be six days for a total of 16 days. Uh, I think you're talking about that time frame of work days. Mm -hmm. So calendar days, that probably would have been closer to 20. Okay. That was, but again, I, I'm not at all prepared to say anything about it or the kind of flight days, but you'll hear that very definitively from the leading company on flight. But I mean, according to the schedules you guys were, were working towards, I mean, do you have some margin or around March, you know, do you have a couple of weeks you can compress or? or uh, uh, let me let me defer all of that to Friday. I really do not want to start preempting the shuttle program. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Gwyneth Shaw, Orlando Sentinel. Yeah, hi. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about some of the water damage from this storm? Um, it was unclear to me when you were talking about um, the building that, that had some intrusion on the fifth floor and below, which building you're talking about and, and how severe that may be long term. Yeah, the, uh, when I was talking about the fifth floor, when I was, it was the OHC building. Uh, it's a part, it's a five story segment to the OHC, which varies all the way from, from a three story office building. Uh, to a high bay. There's a, a, an area that is a five story segment that connects the two, and it was a training facility on the fifth floor. And I will tell you that I was told that it was extensive uh, intrusion of water, that the damage uh, affected all five of those floors, and I'm not sure what the outcome will be there. That's a, that's a non trivial impact of that facility. Any uh, follow up? Yeah, just quickly, was there any? serious problem inside the VAB that, that appears to be a result of, of wind coming in because you did have those missing panels? Yeah, the only one I heard on this is that the, uh, uh, the temporary structure that we have over top of the two external tanks that are housed, as you probably know, in the VAB, they're waiting to go back to Mishu to be refurbished. It's like a tarp and, and whatnot that we have over that to, to make sure that uh, the thing that they dropped did not impact the external tank. Uh, some of that temporary cover for the external tank uh, came 
restaurant guy do the wins that win the VAB and, and the tarp literally fell on top of the tank. I don't think that'll affect the tank at all, but uh, it, it shows that we have a lot of uh, a lot of environmental activity in the VAB that we don't normally have, for sure. Okay, uh, Tarek Malik, to space.com. No questions at this time, thank you. Okay, uh, Brian Berger, Space News. Um, I have a question for uh, Jim, and that would be the uh, $126 million approved as emergency spending to help you recover um, from the previous hurricanes. Uh, do you think that will be adequate to repair the additional damage you suffered from, from Gene? Yeah, I, I really don't want to uh, speculate on what the revised number might be. And, and I, unless I'm behind the eight ball here, your word approved is not a word that I'm using yet. Uh, it was uh, recommended by the White House and sent across to the Hill. But to my knowledge, the Hill has not acted on that yet. Okay, and do you expect to submit some sort of revised figure before this becomes finalized? Well, we, we are looking at what it might be. Uh, if there is a delta cost associated with Gene over and above what the 126 included, we would certainly uh, share that with our headquarters and it would be their call whether or not to go forward. Okay, Penny Reinhardt, uh, Houston Chronicle. <clears throat> yes, can you tell me a little bit about your night hunkering down yeah. at the Space Center and how many people were there? Well, <laughs> Uh, Mark, you, you were there. I'll, I'll tell you my perception and let Mark tell you his. It was both of our first opportunity to be a part of a ride out crew, and we are now proud to be honorary members of the ride out crew. It literally gave us a plaque as we departed Sunday morning. But uh, the, the experience was a very positive one for me. One thing that I always enjoy doing around here is meeting new teams of people and seeing the way they work together as a team. And on the KFC side, our ride out crew is, is about 200 people. As George Diller tells me it's 206. Um, and, uh, and while I probably saw about half of those people, some of them are deployed, for example, each of the order processing facilities uh, has three techs and a safety person assigned. I believe it's about four or five in each of the OPS. The ride out crew is spread around the center. Uh, but Colonel Owen and I had the privilege of serving with at the at the EOC Emergency Operations Center, which is housed in the Launch Control Center, uh, where we probably had what we said maybe 100 people at the LCC. And I just uh, got to witness uh, the, the dynamics of the team working together, people making calls to check on the status of hardware, um, trying to see what it's like to bump in a cot, which is not at all like what I'm used to. Uh, and then to get a, a rude wake-up call at 5 a.m. because water intruded in the fire extinguisher or the fire alarm system that we all got a, got a shocking wake-up call at 0500 hours. Um, but it's a rather austere environment, but it's a safe environment. The LCC is, is good for winds above 150, and so we felt very secure in there. And, uh, and the facility is equipped with all of the necessary communications tools to keep all of the people uh, in contact throughout the storm. Uh, Mark, do you want to add to that? Is this Penny? This is Patty Ryder. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, imagine, if you will, we had 24 people that we, we brought up to the KSC LCC. We also had 150 of our specialty hurricane response um, team members down at Malabar, but from my experience here, we uh, you got a bunch of folks that have a lot of nervous energy because uh, they spent an entire period preparing for this hurricane as it's coming. We have a lot of uncertainty in, in our minds about what we're about ready to face. Uh, we've got, you know, our, our favorite pillow and our sleeping bag and a few things that we happen to get out of the shelf to make sure that uh, we at least had some familiar food. And uh, we run up here and, and kind of hunker down. We've set up cots in the hallways uh, with very little intention of getting any real sleep because uh, we all spend a lot of time sitting in front of the television. But there are opportunities to sit around and uh, 
we set up a command post right immediately and we get, get to work uh, doing reporting and set it up our command and control center at KSC. But there are opportunities to, to sit around and get to know and share stories and share backgrounds with people both within our team and also with the KSC team. So at the same time there's a little bit of apprehension, a little lots of energy and electricity in the air. There's a whole lot of camaraderie that's being built at the same time. So the evening goes on and uh, the folks are, are, are restless. They're ready to see what the, the, the effects of the hurricane are going to be. Uh, there's these little uh, parties, two members of two or three that run outside and check the weather and see how bad the wind is and, and uh, come back with uh, anecdotal uh, data that they share and try to impress each other with. We send more teams running out in the rain and wind and see what they can do. Uh, so all in all, it's, uh, it's a time of uh, balanced seriousness and team building. So it's, uh, I don't want to characterize it as fun because we don't want to do this all the time. But at the same time, as I think it's uh, Americans, it's Floridians that are getting together and make the best of a bad situation. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, I'm not sure if we're allowed follow-up answers. I know you don't <laughs> follow -up, but, but I just want to add one thing. It's, uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm technically not a member of the write-out crew, and so I was really there in an observation capacity. And it always is fun for me to witness leadership at its finest. And I just want to go on record as one of our guys, Wayne Key, who is the chairman of our emergency operations center. He is the leader of the write-out crew. Uh, he has credentials that will knock your socks off because he is also a retired chief master sergeant from the United States Air Force. And to watch the way Wayne is able to lead the uh, the ride out team through the evening was uh, was a pleasure for me as well. You're here, uh, Mr. Kennedy. You can have as many follow up answers as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> That's my last one. <laughs> uh, Todd Halverson, Florida today. Uh, thanks very much. Um, for, for Mr. Kennedy, I, I know the, uh, the schedule for return to flight in the March-April uh, time frame was very tight uh, prior to uh, this rash of hurricanes we've seen here. And I was just wondering what your thoughts as Kennedy Space Center Director are on, on the chances of making that window under these circumstances. Yeah, Todd, what's your follow-up question? <laughs> You, you wasted your first one. What's your follow-up? Okay, the follow-up. Oh, you know, Todd, you know I can't answer that. <laughs> but I'd love to answer a question for you. What, what do you got? Uh, well, uh, tell me what your latest thinking is on uh, your ability to uh, process in the vehicle assembly building in parallel with uh, repair work, whether that can be done and uh, whether you could work in the Northeast some of the BAB safely. Um, just what your latest thinking is on that. Yeah, I'm uh, privileged to have Scott Kerr with us, by the way. Scott is the leader of the Kennedy Space Center recovery team, which will be a significant activity for the months ahead of us. And Scott assures me that before we start processing critical flight hardware in the BAB, we will have the ability to put some temporary structures to make sure that hardware being processed will be safe and secure. And the latest schedule, I will tell you, I don't know what the latest heat date is, but uh, it was November 3rd, uh, a few weeks ago, and today is Tuesday, I've had other priorities and lost track of the latest date for an ET to arrive here, but the return to flight tank was scheduled for November 3rd, I know that. Okay, Dave Waters, uh, News 13. Dave Waters? Okay, uh, Ann Rothwell, Bellis Ward. Thank you. Okay, uh, Gina Treadgold, ABC News. I'm here, Alex. I guess, Jim, what I'd like to know is uh, the, the, the number of hurricanes you've had this year, does that really point out the need for you to to uh, upgrade buildings at the CSC, and how is that port going? I know it's a long-term uh, program for you. Yeah, could you repeat that? I'm sorry, you were breaking up. Oh, sorry. I'm on a cell phone on a beach. So, um, the, how you breaking up? <laughs> yeah. how, how is the, uh, the, the program to upgrade the work? Facilities at KFC going, and obviously this points out the need to get 
a lot of trailers at such AFC. Yeah, like we told you last time, we hope to be able to eliminate uh, trailers as a part of the uh, the appropriations money, which I think is close to being approved. Uh, the money that they're talking about, uh, Edith, will certainly not allow us to to start over and build new buildings that, that maybe have better hurricane protection. Uh, but I will tell you that we will take the $126 million, if that's the number of and, and use it uh, widely to, to reinforce the buildings as best we can. Uh, there's a plan, for example, to, uh, to enable the panels on the VAB to be more resilient uh, to hurricane winds. I mean, that building is right at 40 years old now. And uh, there was a lot of corrosion going on on those panels for for all of those years. And it's part of the reason you can have winds down in the 70, 80 mile an hour range on loose panels. Uh, the engineers are looking at ways that they can go back in and, and reinforce and to, to get the integrity of those panels back to where it was in the mid 60s. So we'll do all we can to reinforce the facilities, but we certainly are not talking about a wholesale. Upgraded facilities at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, do you need any follow-ups? Uh, no, uh, that answered it. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Uh, Beth Vicky, Government Executive. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Jim. Um, I've got a question right along the lines of what uh, Gina was asking. Um, for years, for decades, uh, the uh, status of facilities there at Kennedy has been a concern, uh, particularly the VAB and its roof has been a perennial issue. Uh, would you have any comment on how much of this damage could have been avoided if NASA had put the money into <laughs> facility maintenance that it should have been putting in over the years? Well, let me not talk long-term history because I don't, I've only been here for two years. I will tell you that I have been quite impressed with the monies that NASA headquarters did allow the Kennedy Space Center to do some upgrade facilities. For example, you mentioned the roof to the VAB. Those monies have already been approved, and I guess it's just fortuitous on our part that the job had not been started yet. But those numbers, I think, about like $13 million in the VAB roof. But those monies were pre approved and will be spent now to redo the roof. Uh, well, that works, Scott, the, the, there's a special budget uh, line item that uh, allows us to, to to reinforce facilities, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on what it's called, facility revitalization. There's a facility revitalization budget line item that our headquarters has been working hard to help us over the last couple of years. And I think the money that they tried to help us uh, appropriate for the latest fall uh, is another example that they're they're behind us uh, very well. Another another example is the money that it took to build the second office building, OSB2, uh, which will eliminate many, many people from having to reside in trailers, about 800 uh, people that currently reside in trailers. So my, my, my answer to your question is uh, that, that we recognize there's not a bottomless pit of money out there. And while I think you could argue that we might not have funded some of this as much as we should have, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, I've been pretty impressed with the ability to get some facility revitalization money, and I don't expect that to stop. Real quickly, what was that amount that you mentioned in your answer? Was it? I, di I didn't uh, catch it. You broke up. Well, thirteen million for the VAB roof is that the number you're talking? About? I think it sounded like thirteen or fourteen. Yeah. Yeah, about thirteen million is is the monies that have already been uh, committed to spend on the VAB roof. That job was was to start just within a month or so, and I'm not sure where it is right now. And my follow up is uh, for Mark Owen. Um, could you give us a little more detail on what? kinds or types of support infrastructure have taken the biggest hit. You mentioned uh, that taxpayers' money, I believe I heard you say it's been used well and those facilities have been maintained, but they still took hits. I'm, I'm just curious, do you have a couple of examples? Yes, uh, thanks, Beth. I have two examples for you in particular. One is a uh, what we call the structure shop. 
it uh, supports our civil engineering squad squadron, as well as another hangar type facility that supports uh, a number of our tenant organizations, including uh, to include some of our organizations in which we store um, equipment. And we have some administrative space in both of those facilities this morning when I drove by had their roofs completely peeled back and some of it, some of that roofing material was dangling, but most of that roofing material was in the parking lot um, on the west side, leaving nothing but a, a, an exposed substructure uh, on top. Uh, clearly there's still plywood up there, but I'm not thinking that plywood wood is uh, what it takes to uh, withstand the value to the total after that roof came out. So those are just two examples of structures in which we lost roofs wholesale. Is that what you needed, Beth? Uh, yeah, that's that's good. And I just want to be clear, those are at Patrick, not at the case. Those are at Patrick. That's that's uh, that's true. Now again, like uh, like Kennedy, we have a solid rocket, a solid motor assembly building, and also a solid motor. As assembly and refurbishment building, they're called SMAF and SMARF. Um, it's not named by little blue people, I don't think, uh, little blue cartoon people, but uh, those names uh, are pretty descriptive of what they do and the functions that they house. Um, we had likewise panel damage from Francis, and we had, uh, in some cases, had, well, in both of those cases, had panels being uh, installed. Uh, they were temporary panels being installed when Gene hit us. Uh, we sustained damage again in both of those facilities, and also in a vertical, vertical integration building, there was significant water intrusion as Francis that we had just we used that building. We call it a satellite processing and integration facility in there, and uh, there was also and. Uh, that also, we would just got the conditions in there perfect again to do satellite processing and integration for future customers. In other words, it has stringent requirements for cleanliness, both in particulate and uh, relative humidity. And I think we're back to go on that. And also the Delta checkout facility at the Cape. We call it the uh, DCMO, or the Delta checkout and maintenance uh, facility. Uh, it's also a hangar that lost the door during Francis, and uh, we had put up some environmental closure there. Basically, what we did was a whole bunch of tar paper and plastic and plywood, and uh, and basically turned a door into a wall. And once again, it uh, it is also probably a bit compromised. So those are just some of the examples of uh, the beating that we took down at Patrick, and some of the other examples that up at the Cape that we also took some support facility damage. Thanks. Okay, Rory O'Neill, Metro Radio. No, I'm all set, thanks. Okay, uh, Warren Leary, New York Times. Uh, yes, question for Kennedy. Uh, I guess uh, two actually. Has anyone been out to the launch pads yet, and what's their uh, condition state? And, uh, and secondly, uh, the General Owen said that some of the facilities that, uh, I guess, Patrick, were so badly damaged they might have to be abandoned and replaced. Uh, looking at Kennedy, uh, or the tile repair, or the old, old building. Are there any buildings at Kennedy that might be that bad that you might have to replace? Uh, first question, uh, yes, the dark teams have been to the pad and reported uh, no damage, which is what we expected. That's the same thing we saw in Francis. These winds were lower, and therefore we were pleasantly uh, not surprised. We were pleased. We once again had no damage at the pad. Uh, relative to any possible demolition of our facilities, I will tell you that I don't know of any right now. I know that the uh, TPS folks have moved in the ROV hangar are pleased and punch to be in there. But the facility is probably not ideally speedy. We're doing TPS processing. It's a large, uh, high bay-like hangar facility, and TPS processing requires a single floor. So it's not ideal use of the space. So I suspect uh, we will be rebuilding the TPS facility and sending them back from which they came. But to know what we're planning right now for them is. Thank you. Okay, Richard Harris, NPR. Uh, no question. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tina Stage, Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg Radio? Yeah, okay. Robert Stevens, Interspace News. Uh, I was wondering if um, 
Um, I realize there's no other storm on the way, you know, um, in the way to, based on the, the current repair status. And I thought you were talking about other storms in the Atlantic, but, but maybe I didn't hear you right. Oh, any other storm. The hurricane season lasts until November 30th. Are there any other storms out there? Oh, if you did have another storm, uh, how would it affect you about current state? I'd probably be fired. <laughs> Roy Bridges had the luxury of working here for six years and never had one strike. I've been here for one year and I've had four, so... And I've been here for thir I've been here for 31 days and had four major storms. So uh, I uh, I'm getting a lot of uh, merit badges for leadership under crisis. Okay, I guess we know who the jinxes are, but seriously, uh, could there be a the hand of uh, another storm or damage? Uh, for Absolutely, it could. Um, I, I think Solar Factory has done fairly well given the uh, environment that we have, and. Uh, if another one comes along, we'll prepare. One thing I didn't mention earlier, but I'll, I'll add it because I think it's pertinent to your question. We mentioned this from Francis, but not today. The people go out of their way to secure the facility and the expensive hardware within the facilities. And one reason the impact is going to be as minimal as it is, I think, is a credit to the people who take the time to secure uh, electronic gear and other hardware inside the facility. And I may have missed it uh, earlier. Uh, if you have a pool, it may cost damage uh, and what it's going to cost for repairs uh, from the storm. Now, you, you must be on a cell phone also. You, you broke up a little bit. I'm just wondering if you have an estimate or a tough estimate on the total cost. He's asking for the total cost this time. So no, no, we do not. Okay, uh, Guy Gugliotta, Washington Post. Guy, are you on? Okay, um, that's the list. I'll, I'll, I'll open it up one last time for any uh, go backs from anybody that we may have missed. Um, this is Ziza with uh, Central Florida News 13. Uh, David Waters, I, I was assigned to it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yep, go ahead. Um, will we be able to tour the facility at all in the next week? Yeah, this is Mike Ryan. Um, tomorrow at 10 30. As I said, it's at the end, but tomorrow at 10 30, since we'll be o open for a normal day, there won't be any special passes or anything, but for our normal media, or if you need accredited calls first thing in the morning, tomorrow at 1030, meet out here and we'll take you around and show you uh, what is out here. But I will tell you for the media online that it's going to look a lot like Francis. Uh, so if you have other stories, you may uh, want to put them before this because you're going to see a lot of the same. And so we will be here. Sorry, sir. Okay. Apologies. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Mark Owen. Uh, same. An invitation is extended also to uh, those on the line to come visit us at Patrick uh, and for the Cape. Uh, and please go through uh, Ken Warren for uh, uh, let us know your request. We'd be glad to support you. But likewise, the, the damage that you'll see is, is again, is very Francis-esque, if you will. And uh, for the most part, uh, that's all, that's all I got to say about that. It's, it's not, not much to see. We will be uh, putting our base flag up tomorrow morning in a Reveille ceremony at about 7 o'clock, and you're welcome to join us for that. Of course, it's kind of a symbolic uh, ceremony that we take flag down and, and then we also put it back up. We took this flag down again. I don't think we're going to, if we raise this flag up in the morning at uh, Reveille tomorrow at 7 o'clock, I think we'll let it fly for the day, but I'm. Uh, I'm going to get a new flag because this one's been through every storm for this past this past month, and I'm looking to see if it's having a fresh start here. But then uh, for the media, tomorrow you can do that, but we are planning within a week when we really get going in earnest on the uh, repair work on the VA bay when that is to, to bring media out and explain how we're doing all that and, and show you then. So that's kind of our plan right now. Thank you. Okay, guys, do we have any other last, uh, last minute questions? Yeah, I had one. This is uh, Justin Ray with SpaceFlightNow.com. Uh, for Colonel Owen, uh, perhaps I missed this. Did, did you say anything about uh, the status of the GPS uh, spacecraft? Is, uh, has it been checked uh, yet? And was it returned to its shipping container like uh, during Francis? That's correct. Um, actually, it wasn't a shipping container. It was the container that it, uh, it's in uh, for checkout. It's actually on the stack. Uh, 
as it was it was in the process it was in process for processing if I could say that um, and it uh, it was fueled and what we did was is we put an environmental cover over it recall that we would put up the flight the flight uh, arrow shell over it before we transport it to the to the cape I mean to, yeah to the cape to the pad uh, that hadn't been done but uh, we put an environmental shelter over it and uh, put it under gaseous nitrogen purge and uh, had it on a on a uninterruptible power supply. So, and it uh, did not lose any power. It did not lose the GN2 purge. Uh, we did lose uh, ventilation and air conditioning to the building. But uh, latest I was told is, is we didn't uh, break any constraints in the uh, temperature regime. So, satellite uh, for initial indications our satellite was in an environment it enjoys and was not compromised. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think uh, we've pretty much covered everybody else. Howard, can I get one in? Sure, sure. Todd Halverson of Florida today. I was wondering, uh, Mr. Kennedy, if uh, you guys had any idea right now on how long the repairs to the vehicle assembly building are going to take. I mean, you're talking the immediate repairs will take months to and the final repair will be months to year. So yeah, God, we, we think we're talking many months up to and including probably the one year time frame. And is there any thought about uh, exactly when you'll be able to uh, start processing work again in that facility? Todd, the reason we were offline is I think we had different interpretations of your question. Uh, we will be processing hardware within the VAB within a matter of two or three weeks. Okay, thanks. Okay, with that, we're going to wrap it up.
surprised you didn't have a lot of water. Had about half the water coming down. That's saving great. A lot of daylight coming from inside. Lots of water from the lake from this side. We have had a real obvious uh, In the southern United States, a state of emergency has been declared in Georgia. Tornadoes are expected there and in the Carolinas from Tropical Depression Jean. At least six people were killed when Jean swept across Florida as a Category 3 hurricane. It was the fourth hurricane to hit Florida in the last six weeks. More than two and a half million customers are without power. President George W. Bush has declared Florida a major disaster area. That paves the way for federal aid with massive recovery efforts that are now beginning. Time for a look at the global weather forecast. Here once again is Guillermo Arduino at the CNN International Weather Center. Guillermo, hello. Hi, Fenula. You know, it's 4.20 p.m. Eastern time here, and since early hours this uh, morning, we've seen the rain here in the uh, southern parts of Georgia especially. Let's uh, show Valdosta what was going on earlier today, and uh, that's more or less the kind of weather we can expect now in uh, Georgia. It's raining very intensely at the airport, Hartsfield International Airport in Atlanta, also in Charlotte, North Carolina but especially here in Atlanta. All right, let me show you where the satellite picture um, puts uh, Jean now over here, and it's uh, weakening as you see, but that doesn't mean it's gone. As you said, especially the northeastern quadrant of the cyclone may bring some tornadoes into the Carolinas and uh, also here in uh, Georgia. This is South Carolina, this is North Carolina. You see that North Carolina now is being hit by m in a um, larger amount than in South Carolina, and Charlotte is actually here in, on the border, and we are seeing intense rains. Well, uh, if of course, you know, the bands are bringing the bad weather over here, and we're going to see that uh, very soon, especially moving towards the mid-Atlantic states. And the question is, is it going to uh, actually get to the northeast? Yes, it will, to eventually New York City, but as a mere storm, so it's not going to upset uh, many, many areas in the United States apart from that. All right. Richard Branson is reaching for the stars with his latest adventure, Virgin Galactic. By 2008, Branson's Virgin Group wants to take space tourists suborbital at $200,000 a seat, though the price could tumble if enough seats are sold early on. This will be run as, as, a, as, as a proper version business, and, and the monies we, we, we invest, we, um, you know, we, we, we expect to get enough passengers to make it pay. If, business, if, if space does not pay as a business, space will not have any future. Virgin plans to build five reusable space planes, each with five passenger seats to take stargazers 130 kilometers above Earth, far enough to see the curvature of the Earth, all in comfort and style. Virgin is licensing the technology from billionaire Paul Allen, who backed Spaceship One, the world's first privately funded manned space vehicle. The legendary man behind the technology says space tourism will be as safe as early commercial airline travel. We'll be offering that with a non-complex a uh, very robust, very simple uh, airplane, what it amounts to. Branson and Bert Rattan say after suborbital flight can come orbital trips, then a Virgin Hotel in space. As you can tell, I'm over the moon. And even Virgin tourists on the moon. I think I'm a bit cynical about going to the moon. Certainly it's not going to happen in my lifetime, or I think Bert. Virgin plans to pump up to $100 million into Galactic, so sure is Branson that people will pay for a three-hour space flight and to experience weightlessness, even if just for three or four minutes. Jim Bolden, CNN, London. Really, the private craft took off. 
Uh, it was on the underbelly of a plane that carried it past 15,000 meters. At that point, the two separated. There you see him firing 52 seconds into the flight. He began to roll, and you'll see it here uh, on videotape. This roll went on 30 or 40 times he went over. Uh, that doesn't make the controllers on the ground very happy at all. P the pilot, though, Mike Melville, described it as fun. He did reach his 60-mile mark in the altitude. They're after the Ansari Prize. They have to repeat this next week. Everybody's back on the ground safely. I'm sure there are a lot who would describe that as fun, but right now we're going to take a break. Raumflugzeug Spaceship One ist wieder in der kalifornischen Mojave-Wüste gelandet. Zuvor war es vom Rücken eines Trägerflugzeugs ins All gestartet und erreichte dabei eine Höhe von etwa 100 Kilometern. Es ist bereits der zweite Allflug mit Spaceship One. Diesmal gab es zwar kleinere Komplikationen, am Ende landete das Flugzeug aber sicher. Das gebaute und betriebene Raumflugzeug Spaceship One ist am Abend sicher in der kalifornischen Mojave-Wüste gelandet. Knapp eineinhalb Stunden zuvor war es auf dem Rücken eines Trägerflugzeugs abgehoben. Eine Stunde später löste es sich dann, um auf eine Höhe von etwa 100 Kilometer zu steigen. Es ist bereits der zweite erfolgreiche Allflug mit Spaceship One. Pilot Mike Melville hatte bereits im Juni die Erdatmosphäre verlassen. Diesmal gab es zwar kleinere Komplikationen, am Ende landete das Flugzeug aber sicher in der Wüste. Am 4. Oktober soll hier der dritte erfolgreiche Flug ins All stattfinden. Wenn es gelingt, bekommt die Spaceship One Crew ein Preisgeld von 10 Millionen Dollar. Dem kalifornischen Raketenflugzeug Spaceship One ist der erste Teil im Rennen um den 10 Millionen Dollar Ansari X-Preis gelungen. In der kalifornischen Wüste startete ein Trägerflugzeug, das Spaceship One wie in dieser Animation in 15 Kilometern Höhe absetzte. Von dort flog die Raumfähre an die Grenze zum Weltall in 100 Kilometern Höhe. Eine Stunde später war sie aus eigener Kraft zurück. Gelingt dies innerhalb der nächsten zwei Wochen ein zweites Mal, ist der Wettbewerb gewonnen. <lacht> and exceeding 99 kilometers above California. But it wasn't without a few nervous moments on the ground. The private craft took off, attached to the belly of an airplane that carried it past 15,000 meters. At that point, the two craft separated. But 52 seconds into the flight, the aircraft started to roll more than 30 times. It didn't stop until after the burn ended and the craft reached its top altitude. Well, Spaceship One then began its descent and landed safely. It is scheduled to fly again next Monday to meet the requirements of a $10 million prize. The Ansari X Prize was established in 1996 as a financial incentive for aviation entrepreneurs. Talking about out of it, you know, Gene, that caused so much devastation in the States, continues to bring some rain in the New England area and parts of, of Canada. But let's take a look at Virginia yesterday. Even though it was not a hurricane, it was causing some problems, lots of rain, and it was not moving that slowly either, but it caused floods in Virginia. This is from Roanoke, and uh, people were really concerned about what was going to happen later on. Boston saw lots of winds and also rain associated with this, but long gone now. On the launch site at California's Mojave Desert is Kimberly OCS. Kimberly? Hello, Toomey. Well, I tell you, those champagne corks have already been popped. The requisite victory lap taken and 10 million bucks almost in the bank as 51-year-old Brian Benny pilot come astronaut and Spaceship One sail into space history. All systems go 368,000 feet into the sky. A record was broken and the prize was won. Today, history was made. It was a picture-perfect flight on a picture-perfect day. At the controls of Spaceship One, 51-year-old Navy-trained pilot Brian Benny. He joined his teammate Mike Melville now among the ranks of astronauts. It was the second flight in as many weeks to enter suborbital space and then return to Earth with the weight of three people on board. Now the Spaceship One team can claim the 10 million Ansari X Prize, established eight years ago to spark an interest in space tourism. It's been a hard job, but it's been a fun job. And when your heart's in it, um, it, uh, it makes all, all the difference. Microsoft billionaire Paul Allen has bankrolled the whole endeavor, sinking over $20 million into the project. On Monday, he saw at least a partial return on his money. This is uh, one of the most gratifying, rewarding things I've ever been part of. 
If you're willing to shell out $200,000 by 2007, you may be able to take a rocket ride into space. It's already been called Virgin Galactic, in fact. Richard Branson of Virgin Airlines has bought the technology to the whole thing, so uh, if you're willing to pay for it, you got a ride. <laughs> Reporting live from the Mojave Desert, Kimberly Osias, back to you, Tumi. All right, Kimberly, thank you very much. Well. Ship One hat den Ansari X-Preis für das erste privat entwickelte, bemannte Raumschiff gewonnen und damit 10 Millionen Dollar. Eine Transportmaschine war mit dem Spaceship One von einem Flughafen in den USA gestartet. Dann wurde es ausgeklingt, der Pilot zündete das Raketentriebwerk. Wenig später verließ das Raumschiff für kurze Zeit die Erdatmosphäre. Nach dem rund 90-minütigen Flug landete es wieder sicher auf dem Boden. Spacecraft. It was the second time the spacecraft reached the Earth's atmosphere. The team behind the rocket claimed a $10 million prize. The rocket plane, funded by Microsoft co-founder Paul G. Allen, took off from a runway in the Mojave Desert. It was slung to the belly of a carrier and then released at about 46,000 feet. Test pilot Brian Binney fired the spaceship's rockets to continue to the edge of space at three times the speed of sound. It returned to Earth about 90 minutes after leaving the ground. Space. Why commercial space travel could finally be within reach, that's after the break. Barrier to commercial space travel has been broken. Spaceship One, funded by Microsoft's co-founder Paul Allen and designed by Bert Rutten, has completed its second journey into space in five days and picked up the $10 million Ansari X Prize along the way. Spaceship One met competition criteria flying three people 100 kilometers above the Earth twice in 14 days. Well, the Ansari X Prize was established in 1996 to encourage privately funded low-cost space travel. <coughs> A similar competition, the Orteig Prize, won by Charles Lindbergh in 1927, spawned the commercial aviation industry. Now Spaceship One could also pave the way for future low-cost space travel. The world's first privately built spacecraft took off from the Mojave Desert in uh, California at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, that's 4 p.m. Central European Time, and it made a record-breaking return. CNN's Kimberly Assayas was there to witness its successful landing. Those champagne corks have already been popped, the requisite victory lap taken, and 10 million bucks almost in the bank as 51-year-old Brian Benny, pilot come astronaut and Spaceship One sail into space history. All systems go, 368,000 feet into the sky. A record was broken and the prize was won. Today, history was made. It was a picture-perfect flight on a picture-perfect day. At the controls of Spaceship One, 51-year-old Navy-trained pilot Brian Benny. He joined his teammate Mike Melville now among the ranks of astronauts. It was the second flight in as many weeks to enter suborbital space and then return to Earth with the weight of three people on board. Now the Spaceship One team can claim the 10 million Ansari X Prize, established eight years ago to spark an interest in space tourism. It's been a hard job, but it's been a fun job and when your heart's in it um, it uh, it makes all all the difference Microsoft billionaire Paul Allen has bankrolled the whole endeavor sinking over 20 million dollars into the project on Monday he saw at least a partial return on his money this is uh, one of the most gratifying rewarding things I've ever been part of if you're willing to shell out $200,000 by 2007, you may be able to take a rocket ride into space. It's already been called Virgin Galactic, in fact. Richard Branson of Virgin Airlines has bought the technology to the whole thing, so uh, if you're willing to pay for it, you got a ride.
Gordo was one of the most straightforward people I've ever known. What you saw was what you got. And pride in doing a good job, whatever his assignment, was his hallmark. You could always depend on Gordo. It's hard to believe that he's no longer with us in person. But I'm as certain as anything I can be certain of that he is with us today here in spirit. We are no longer seven, we are three. The Soviets are no longer 12, they are five. But the, although the numbers are diminished, the value of, to the members of the groups are not diminished by time. We are here to mark the passing of one of our own, Gordon Cooper. I was mission control for him on his Mercury 9 flight. But it's, it's amazing how, how we worked together so closely, as Scott was mentioning. The bonding we had was just interminable, it'll last forever. And the seven of us look back on that with, with great fondness. But I appreciate the opportunity to represent the NASA family today at this heartfelt tribute to a hero for millions of Americans, Colonel L. Gordon Cooper, Jr. He was born in the American heartland and destined to soar in our nation's spacious skies and in the heavens above. Gordon Cooper was one of the last original NASA lone eagles to fly in Project Mercury and now is one with the stars. Today, an appreciation for Gordon's enormous contribution to the exploration of space. I would like to present to Susie Gordon a symbol of NASA's deepest respect. The Distinguished Service Medal, created on July 29, 1959, is our agency's highest honor. It recognizes a distinguished service to the nation for pioneering space frontier. We would like to remember Colonel L. Gordon Cooper, who passed away recent. A fellow space traveler, Colonel Cooper paved the way for us to go to the moon and beyond. He was in the first group of Americans ever to fly to space, and with his Mercury and Gemini missions, set the kind of endurance records needed to prove that humans can live and work in space. We long-duration astronauts and cosmonauts can relate to his legacy. Our hearts and prayers are with the family. For his heroism and as one of mankind's first delegates to the stars, we the crew would like to remember Colonel Gordon Cooper by ringing the ship's bell on board the International Space Station. One of our core values at NASA is valuing the NASA family. And nowhere does that come more to mind for me than when I'm walking through this grove. This is a special place, and it's fitting that it, we honor the memory of one of our original seven here today. 
I see my friends here on a regular basis. There's uh, Dave Walker, Red Dog, my commander on STS-53 over there. Rick Willie and the rest of the 107 crew are in the back over there. And uh, Ellison's, I gotta see it. There it is, Ellison's tree's right over there in the rest of the Challenger crew. There's a lot of friends here. We can see their faces and their smiles. We remember all their little quirks and we hear their laughter and words of encouragement. We see them grow stronger every year and we can draw upon their strength as we tackle all of life's little challenges that face us from day to day. This grove is a very special place indeed and Gordo's gonna be in good company.